I welcome you to, the, uh, to this session of the second day international conference on Ottomans and the Malay world. Yeah, it's on first day. <laughs> Sorry. It's the first day of the two day conference, inshallah. Uh, this, uh, the first day, the evening session, uh, we are going to be uh, we are going to be having uh, uh, this session. I'm going to hand. We are going to be having the next speaker, uh, who is going to be uh, that is uh, Mr. Shafiq Mardi from Department of Malay Studies. Uh, that is uh, National University of Singapore. You are welcome, brother. And our moderator for this session uh, is none other than. Sister Shah, uh, Shahira uh, Sulatri Asman from uh, Amik. Uh, you are welcome, Sister. Please may you take over as a moderator. Thank you, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, a very good afternoon, everybody. How are you today? I think happy mood after the lunch, right? Alhamdulillah. Well, let us begin. So my name is Sister Shahira Sulastri, and I am representing from AMEC, uh, Asia Middle East uh, Research Institute. And um, here we have a very one of the guests from us today, Mr. Shafiq Mardi. So before we go over with Mr. Shafiq, let me introduce a little bit about Mr. Shafiq Mardi. So thank you, Mr. Shafiq, for being here with us. So Shafiq is currently a PhD candidate uh, from NUS, National University of Singapore, in the Malaysia Studies Department. Malaysia. Malay Studies Department, thank you. And he served as a researcher at the National Library Board and was responsible for researching and collecting archives of diplomatic relation letters between the Apikilego and the Ottoman government. He also wrote several articles that were published, such as the role of Singapore for Muslims during Ottoman Balkan Wars. Mr. Shafiq has an honors degree in theology studies from Chukuro University. I hope I said that right. Yeah. My Turkish isn't that good. And continue his postgraduate at the same institute in the Institute of Social Sciences, uh, Department of Islamic History and Arts. His thesis um, entitled The Relationship Between the Ottoman and Singapore under Prof. El Fateh Yahya Ayaz, a distinguished historian specializing in history of the Middle East, received attention from the Singaporean ambassador to Turkey, His Excellency Mr. Jonathan Thal. Shafiq is also fluent in four languages, mashallah. Uh, it was uh, Malay, English, Turkish, and Arabic, and is what else is there? I think a lot of questions will come up later. So, Mr. Shafiq, um, without further ado, please, uh, you have the board, you have the platform. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister, for your introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. First of all, I would like to thank all of you, especially... Uh, distinguished professors, Prof. Fari Alatas, and my uh, during my master's examiner, one of them is Prof. Ismail Hakka Goksai, uh, and all uh, and all other friends here for joining this conference today. So, uh, for my conference today, I would like to present on the Singapore Sepoy Mutiny 1915 and the Ottoman relations. So before I start, uh, let me give a historical background on the 1915, because we know that uh, World War I uh, appeared or World War I broke out in 1914, 1924. Or, yeah, during those times, there's uh, wars happening in the world, uh, in European world, actually, I could say, not really world. Yeah, but the influence of the World War I is uh, tremendous in, in the European world. But it, the, in this part of the world, such as Singapore, Malaysia, the influence are not that much, actually. It's indirect influence. However, 
in Singapore, what happened in 1915, there was a Sepoy Mutiny, or they call it Sepoy Rebellion, some of the resources Sepoy Rebellion. And all these terms are being used by the uh, colonial uh, records as Sepoy Mutiny, Sepoy Rebe Rebellion. But if we look through at the Ottoman state archives, they use different terms. Example, instead of rebellion, they will say uh, revolution. Uh, and the word is Sipahi Ayaklanma. So it's, uh, yeah, it's you, it's, those terms are very, uh, although it's uh, not so much clear, but somehow we know where it stands actually, whether it's a rebellion or revolution. And most of the uh, re research has been done in, on this issue is based on either British resources or Dutch. And we know that both British and Dutch, they, are, they were colonial powers in this era. Uh, in this in this area actually so what i could say is uh during this uh rebellion or revolution happened uh there are many narratives on this issue so it was uh, uh pre-world war and then you know world war uh, war happened because of narratives being propagated around the world so what happened is according to colonial narratives that the Indians, the Indian soldiers, Indian soldiers in uh, which was stationed in Singapore, they uh, they rise against or they revolt against the British. Some of the research say is because they are being uh, influenced by German uh, anti-colonial propaganda, and some of them say that they they are fighting for Indian independence. But uh, this two goals, uh, these two narratives or these two aims which was mentioned by the Dutch or by the British, they, they, they do have uh, a wide interest in those who had research on this, especially this uh, on this issue, uh, the Singapore Straits Times, they had uh, uh, reported on this issue quite extensively. Uh, but while doing this research, I came across uh, there's uh, if I'm not mistaken, she mentioned that some of the uh, the Sepoy Mutinis they are influenced by the uh, uh, Caliphate movement, and, and then that such research has not been done. For that reason, I I wanted to understand the Sepoy Mutiny from the Ottoman State Archives record actually, and from the Ottoman State Archives records, I could understand the role of uh, Malay Rajas, Ex example, uh, Raja Pera and Raja Johor during this mutiny. And what do the Ottoman, or what does the uh, Ottoman State Archives did mention on this incident, the same incident, which is uh, according, which is totally negative according to the British uh, resources, British and Dutch resources. So according to the British resources and the colonial uh, resources, they mentioned that uh, his, Highness Sultan Ibrahim uh, worked together and supported the British by sending troops to stop uh, to stop against the uh, to stop the Sepoy from uh, from this rebellion, and also the, uh, he was given medal and uh, uh, they are given awards by the British for 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 helping them the British, and. This what uh, and then at the end of the Sepoy Mutini, the Mutinas were being uh, we call it public executed in Ottoman prison in Singapore. That's what being reported in the British and the Dutch records. But when I it was two thousand twenty two when I uh, twenty one yeah twenty one when I first stepped into the Ottoman State Archives and I researched on Singapore. And in the Ottoman State Archive, there's a lot, there's 286 records on Singapore. And then what happened was, then there's, there's uh, the, the font was called, uh, was written as Singapore uh, Sipahi uh, Ayaklan Masa, or they call it Sing Singapore Sipahi Revolution. So it was like, okay, and the, the, the date is 1915. So when I read that, okay, I know it's rebellion, but here is revolution, right? So I start to open it. When I open it, a total, I could say that a total different narratives being appeared there. And I'm pretty sure uh, Prof Ismail Hakka also uh, saw that actually because he was my examiner actually. <laughs> yeah. So in that 
in that uh, report, it was reported by Rafat Bey, the, uh, the Ottoman consulates, uh, uh, the Ottoman ambassador to Batavia. He reported extensively and uh, carefully on the Sepoy mutiny in 1915. So what happened was, in his report, he got this uh, information from, of, of course, the informants which he has in Southeast Asia. In this report, he mentioned that first, the Sepoy mutiny happened is because the Indian Muslim soldiers, they, support the, they supported the Ottoman caliphates uh, uh, in the hope of gaining independence of India. Secondly, the, uh, he also reported that uh, propaganda papers, which was being uh, propaganda pamphlets, I could say, which was being uh, distri distributed in Singapore, actually was intended to be sent to India. But then it was being printed in Batavia, transferred to Singapore, and then intended to send to India, but it stops in Singapore. And thirdly, he mentioned, and I quote him, he said that although uh, the, uh, Jaha, Johor, uh, the Raja of Johor and the Raja of Perak did send uh, you call it uh, Aska Malayu or Malay, Malay soldiers to stop this rebellion because he was, uh, he was, he is important for him to send it is because we are, we, and they were under the British colony. But he also instructed the Aska Malayu or the Malay soldiers not to shoot at the Indian Muslim soldiers. So when we look this in a bigger picture, and he also continued it actually. During the Sepoy, uh, during the Sepoy mutiny on the second day or third day, what happened was they were, some of them were hiding at Istana Woodnyuk. Istana Woodnyuk is an Istana which is belong to the Johor Maharaja Johor. Uh, till today, it's still in Singapore. Yeah. So they were hiding there. So according to according to the uh, Ottoman State Archives, that. At first, they were uh, they they were very sympathized towards these uh, Indian soldiers. Actually, they were, uh, because like they are fighting for Islam, and they call them as uh, uh, Muslim Kardashians, our Muslim brothers. These are the terms they're being used. But at the end of it, we could see that uh, Ottoman do sympathize them actually, and they were at the end of the report of Rafat Bey. He said, uh, like, uh, inna lillah wa inna ilahi rajiun, and may God, uh, we call it, uh, uh, may their soul rest in peace. And although the, the situation is the same, which is reported by the British and the Dutch, and is the same as uh, British and Dutch, but the idea of fighting between them, the cause of fighting is different. The British and the Dutch mentioned that they were fighting for, first, because anti-colonial movement, Second, they are fighting because uh, there's a miscommunication. This is all being found in uh, Straits Times newspaper. They are, they, uh, one of the uh, analysts say, uh, one of the research said that they wanted, they were intended to be sent to Hong Kong, but uh, somehow uh, rumors spread that their ship will be call it, sunk by the British. But all these are not uh, mentioned in the Ottoman State Archives. And what the Ottoman State Archives, as reported by Rafat Bey, is they were supporting the Ottoman Caliphate to fight for the Caliphate, and they they won't they would not want to fight against the Caliphate and support the British. Although they were they were under the, they were they were part of the British army actually, and this is where we could see that uh, how the uh, global political phenomena uh, had uh, deep uh, uh, deep influence in Singapore actually because. Singapore being a multicultural, multi-religious po political focal point in the in the bigger globe, actually. And at the end of it, there's a guy named um, just now while we were having our lunch. There's in the in the British uh, records say there's a guy named Kasim Mansur. Kasim Mansur, his name was not found in any of the Ottoman State Archives report by Rafat Bey. He's not mentioned. But uh, upon research, uh, Kasim Mansur, he, he is uh, one of the main idea to fight against the British. He is a, a jewelry trader, gems trader actually in Singapore. And his brother is a, a Ottoman consulate in Rangoon, which is 
there in Rangoon actually. And he, he had uh, deep connections with the brother actually. And he even in the, one of the archives, in the Ottoman archives, I saw his name, he, he wanted to become uh, Ottoman consulates. But I, uh, there's no reply at all, yeah. So that's, that's the, uh, we call it, that's what happened in, during that era actually of the Sepoy mutiny. And unfortunately, most of the research being done today is all based on uh, colonial narratives, which is they are anti-colonial, they, they wanted to destroy Singapore, uh, all these things, but uh, from the Ottoman archives, they, that's not what they want actually. And so I, I would like to say that I, I'm refraining myself from using some of the research to say that they were, they were uh, fighting because of they were influenced by pan-Islamism idea. I, pre, I prepare myself using these terms. Is this, this term is because uh, in the word pan-Islamism is from is it's not what mean, uh, mentioned in the Ottoman State archives. Instead, they, in most of the Ottoman uh, records, is mentioned as Itihadul Islam, which is Islamic un unity. So uh, it's different connotation. Itihadul Islam, Islamic unity, and pan-Islamism, uh, it doesn't sound, it, it may have the same, it have different agenda behind it, actually. And most of the research say that they were being influenced by pan-Islamic ideas, anti-colonialist ideas. But is it is uh in the Ottoman Sarka you say that it, they are they wanted to support the Ottoman in the hope that the independence of India they can achieve. I think what, what, how many times do I left? Okay, so uh so while doing this research, I it I I decided to take one step back. So at the end of during in the uh, in the British archives in the British newspapers mentioned that uh, I think you can see here yeah Sultan Ibrahim so when during the mutiny happened Sultan Ibrahim did send troops to Singapore with the as tentera Melayu yeah yeah tentera Melayu and after the end of the at the end of the uh, Sepoy or the rebellion what happened was he he received medley uh, uh, praises from the British and all. But uh, surprisingly, in the Ottoman State Archives, he, he was also being praised by Rafat Bey because he works together by allowing, uh, by instructing the Malay soldiers not to fight against, uh, by allowing the Malay soldiers not to fight against the Indian Muslim soldiers. So you can see there's a political play there. And it's very interesting in, in, in order to, in, in, for us to really examine the political aspect of it, actually. And uh, lastly, I could say that the Sepoy Mutiny is a tragic event. Happening, uh, it did happen in Singapore uh, in before World War I because they did kill uh, civilians, they did kill uh, publics, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, the officers there. But uh, there's nothing to justify that. But the cause of it, is uh, which being narrated by the British or the Dutch is almost the same, but not by the Ottoman, which is uh, not the same actually. Yeah, and most of the resources being mentioned is just uh, is I could say is very complicated. Uh, is very uh, how can I say it doesn't fit together actually. For well, example, like from the British uh, record, they say that they they say that is because they are influenced by German anti-colonial movement. Yeah, but uh, there's no records of it. Like I didn't see where is the pamphlets actually. What I what, what I have seen is the uh, we call it uh, the uh, the pamphlets which is pro Ottoman, which is being printed in Indonesia and uh, distributed in Singapore. And I see that I think in the Ottoman archive they did add that pamphlets and it's written in Urdu language. Yeah, and they did mention about Singapore. And at the end of the uh, and I, when I got it translated at the end of the the uh, brochure or pamphlets, they did mention that it's better to uh, uh, die than live at, uh, than than live as a as a slave. Yeah, and probably that's where they got the motivation to to rebe rebel against the British. Actually, I think that's all for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chef.
Thank you, Shafiq. It was a very uh, interesting and some of it is new information to us. So just to summarize, um, the conflict between nations do not occur suddenly mm. and it is a result of the accumulations of factors uh, etc that leads to war so and war happens when diplomacy ends uh we can see this in the case of palestine and israel i think and how narratives play a role uh, a role an important role especially right now in the media um so moving on without further ado i think there are a lot of questions from the audiences so please welcome the audience who have questions please come forward and all you can do is just press the button. Um, yes, Professor, sir. you may introduce yourself. Um, <clears throat> Farid Alatas from National University of Singapore. Uh, okay, Shafiq, uh, thank you for your presentation. I, it, I, it's interesting the um, facts, historical mm -hmm. facts that we, we don't know about. Um, and it's good that you have you know, been able to get them from the archives. Um, so my, my my question has to do with contextualizing, mm -hmm. right? So there, there are a lot of facts. Mm -hmm. um, the, the views in the uh, from the Ottomans that their, their interpretation about the Sepoy mutiny was uh, um, something to do with them wanting uh, caliphate, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's different from the the, the, the analysis or the, the views in the British mm -hmm. uh, the British control media, mm -hmm. Straits Times and so on. Yes, yeah. Straits Times. Okay. Yeah. Now, so I think that's interesting, but I think it's important to put that within the context. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if the so the the, the, the Ottomans are um, observing what is happening in colonial mm -hmm. Singapore, mm -hmm. um, and then you find statements. In the Ottoman press, in the Ottoman mm -hmm. media, about what they think about what is happening in Singapore, mm -hmm. that should be placed within a larger perspective of what was the Ottoman view about British colonialism. Mm -hmm. I think this is important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, those statements they don't mean much beyond what they are saying. Mm -hmm. But if if you're able to put them within the context of if you can construct, you know, or reconstruct what is the Ottoman view, let's say from the 19th century onwards until um the, let's say the world war one mm -hmm. what they'll do the ottomans uh, what is the ottoman theory about british colonialism okay how do they understand it mm -hmm. then okay. you can put these sentences mm -hmm. that you have been extracting from the media mm -hmm. it, within that context uh thank you so much Prof, for your advice uh, uh from my research uh most of the ottoman uh resources especially the newspapers uh, the archives and uh, and the reports being written on Singapore and the British colony, nothing, not, not much of neg negativity if we were to compare with uh, Dutch colonialism in Indonesia. So uh, I could say that pro in they, they don't mention anything about uh, British colonialism at all. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of like then uh, their views on uh, Singapore under British colony, yeah, we are talking about the archives. Yeah, they are uh, on their perspective on British colonialism, not much actually, I but on, they have uh, very negative views on the Dutch colonialism in Indonesia. Yeah, I know you you are you are saying this about the archives. Mm, yeah, archives and reports. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. what about the Ottoman, you know, writings, scholarship, mm -hmm. historical works? What what are they saying about? British. Uh, because you did from the 16th i would say from the 16th century 16th, yeah. onwards mm -hmm. um when the europeans are uh you know in, 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 uh, making incursions into ottoman empire mm -hmm. and the ottoman empire becomes uh, gradually weaker mm -hmm. for example from the 16th century onwards the ottoman empire stops being a major exporter of uh, of mm -hmm. uh, finished product of silk mm -hmm. right yes they, ex they export raw silk to europe and then they import the finished product. Yeah. So they, they become weaker you mm -hmm. know, economically and gradually um, politically, mili militarily. Mm -hmm. So they are conscious about the incursions of the Europeans. Yes. They're conscious, conscious about colonialism. Mm -hmm. So there must be you know, Ottoman scholarship thinking about what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. What is happening, what, what is happening with, the, you know, with, the, with the Europeans? Why are the Europeans becoming more powerful? Yeah. And then when the Europeans 
colonize various areas, mm -hmm. they, they will obviously be reflecting on this. Mm -hmm. So you need to to reconstruct that reflection. Then mm -hmm. you can put these sentences, mm -hmm. these statements you are gathering from the archives mm -hmm. within yes. that uh, you know context. context. That's, okay. that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Maybe our friends, our professors from from Turkey will be able to yeah. tell us about the Ottoman views about colonialism. Just uh, a reminder, there's only two minutes, so we well, uh, uh, well, uh, interesting point uh, put forward by the very Belak Tas. Of course, uh, Ottoman uh, government uh, always uh, tried to get information uh, about the Muslim communities uh, ruled by the, uh, by the uh, European colonial powers. Uh, and uh, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, they didn't have much uh, means to get information. Mm -hmm. But uh, after appointing uh, Turkish uh, Ottoman co uh, consul generals to Batavia, so uh, usually uh, all the stuff, uh, official documents or reports uh, on the region come from the uh, Batavian uh, uh, Ottoman consul generated. So, uh, what kind of events uh, occurred uh, in uh, Java, Sumatra, uh, Singapore, and other areas uh, come from this uh, uh, this uh, consulate? Uh, so, Refet Bey, who was the, the last uh, Ottoman consul general uh, in uh, Batavia, Jakarta, he worked for a, a very long time. Mm. Uh, just uh, before uh, the war, he was appointed there. And then uh, he uh, stayed there for a longer period until the establishment of the Turkish Republic in 1923. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, he uh, wrote the report, as you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, in your uh, thesis and also in, in this talk. Uh, he got information from some uh, Indian uh, colleagues, okay. probably, how uh, what kind of uh, events uh, going on? Uh, because uh, I mean, uh, they uh, uh, Ottomans and the Germans cooperated with each other uh, in Batavia, uh, propagating uh, especially uh, Ottoman victories in Dardanelles and also uh, in. Uh, 1915 uh, and 1916, some uh, they had a lot of uh, corporate activities uh, in the region. So uh, there are some, of course, uh, propagation uh, pamphlets mm -hmm. uh, uh, published in Batavia, mm -hmm. and these were distributed by the uh, some uh, Indian origin uh, uh, persons mm -hmm. uh, to Singapore, uh, Malaya and also to uh, India. Mm. So uh, some of them, of course, were uh, cached by the uh, Dutch uh, authorities. Mm. Uh, and later on, uh, even there was one uh, printing house in Batavia. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, pamphlets uh, propagating uh, the Ottoman sympathy uh, mm. among the Muslim communities. Uh, was uh, because of the British uh, imposition uh, on the Dutch. Dutch was uh, on the neutral side uh, during the First World War. So uh, they Dutch tried to control whether uh, there is a uh, stuff published by that uh, printing house uh, against the British uh, war uh, aims uh, there. So uh, when we look at the, uh, the spoil uh, mutiny, uh, held in Singapore. Of course, uh, there are some studies uh, 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 done uh, on uh, by the uh, some scholars uh, based on the uh, sources, especially. But we have very little uh, information about the Ottoman archives mm. uh, on that subject. So, according to Ottoman uh, 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 reports, uh, there are some influence. Uh, of that uh, Ottoman uh, activities uh, in the region uh, as well. We can understand this kind of uh, reports uh, as well. 
but Spoils uh, movement is also uh, goes back to uh, Indian soldiers uh, uh, anti-British activities, mm. which started uh, also uh, in USA at that time because okay. the British used a lot of uh, Indian soldiers during the First World War. Mm. So uh, there was a very uh, antipathy against the British, although they were uh, as a uh, soldiers because most of them uh, also uh, Muslim uh, uh, the soldiers, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, working in the British uh, yeah. army. Even during the Dardanelles War, where there were a lot of uh, Indian uh, soldiers. So when they saw uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, the enemy, uh, si uh, when they're fighting against the enemy side, they saw uh, Muslim people. So uh, they decided later on, uh, or they escaped from the British uh, bases to uh, uh, to surrender to the Turkish uh, army uh, in Dardanelles. Mm. So we can find this kind of uh, Muslim uh, sympathy uh, towards uh, the Ottoman Caliphate, Ottoman Empire in those times uh, because of the colonial, uh, uh, I mean, uh, ideology atmosphere. Uh, which uh, are uh, very, uh, I mean, disturbing uh, uh, things uh, for, for them. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the Ottoman perspective uh, at that time was uh, that uh, Ottomans, uh, especially during the Abdul Hamid uh, period, uh, I mean, uh, they were very uh, unhappy about the treatment of the Muslim people uh, mm -hmm. under the British rules. So, for instance, uh, the commander of the Air Tour of Katayn, when uh, it was in Singapore, he reported about uh, the conditions of the Muslim people living uh, even in Thailand, in Patani, and also in Malaya, Sumatra, under the uh, Dutch and the British uh, government. And, uh, I mean, the uh, commander, Turkish commander, uh, compares uh, mm -hmm. Dutch uh, attitudes towards the people with the British one. And it says, well, British uh, provides more freedom mm -hmm. uh, than uh, the Dutch uh, to the uh, Muslim uh, people uh, in, in this area. So, uh, I mean, the Ottoman government knows uh, what is going on, especially uh, in this region and Mashallah. also in some other regions uh, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. I think, Shafiq, that's a lot of input for you to put mm. in your PhD, all the best. <laughs> and if there are any other questions, perhaps you can directly go to Mr. Shafiq because we have time constraints with the other speakers. I'm sorry. Uh, so thank you. Let's give a round of applause with Mr. Shafiq. Oh, Mr. Shafiq, please. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank the moderator and our presenter for this session. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you for the attention. Uh, inshallah, because of time, we are not going to go in for question and answer and take more time. Mm -hmm. But because of time, please bear with us. We need to go to another session. Another session before I can release you to go. Uh, <laughs> another session is going to be the Ottomans' uh, concubine to the Sultana of Johor, the story of Khadija Hanun. So before you can go, inshallah, we can uh, present the gifts. Uh, yes, we can. Can we get the gifts, inshallah, for our moderator and the presenter, uh, uh, Sister uh, Shanaz? Yes, you can. At the end of the session. Yeah, yeah. So, inshallah, we can get the gifts. Uh, and we'll kindly request Professor Farid, inshallah, to give our participants, our our, uh, our presenter, and uh,
uh, uh, thank you so much. Inshallah, we are going to go to the next session. I'm going to uh, request Sister. Uh, this session is going to be by Sister Shazwan, Shazwani Elias from Istak. And the speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Typhon uh, Akgam. Uh, I hope I pronounce it properly from Istak, Bethany so please allow me to give this session to the moderator. Please take over. We have 30 minutes, then 15 minutes uh, uh, question and answer. Thank you. I don't know this one. The typhoon. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and very good afternoon to all of the participants in this poll, be it in or in the East Tech TV virtually. Okay. Bismillah. Uh, my name is Nurul Shazwani Ilyas. So uh, I will be the moderator for this session, yeah. for the fourth session. So the speaker for today is Brother Typhoon Akun. Did I mention? Did I? Typhoon Akun is really good Akun. pronunciation. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. 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 Okay, before we go further, uh, allow me to introduce our speaker for this session. Brother Typhoon Akun is a PhD candidate at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTEC, IUM. He has a bachelor degree in history from Pamukkale University, mm -hmm. Turkey, and a master's degree in history and civilization from IUM. I believe he's in Gomba, correct? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. His research interests are in Islamic reform in the Malay world, Malaysian historiography, and Ottoman Southeast Asian relations. And among his published works are Said Sheikh Al Hadith. Views on the Educational Reforms in Malaya, the Ottoman Consulate in Singapore, 1864 to 1926, and the Beginnings of Modern History Studies in Malaysia, a bibliometric study of the Journal of the Historical Society, the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, 1960 to 1969 and 1970. Alhamdulillah. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Brother Typhoon for his uh, presentation in, on the interesting topic entitled From the Ottoman Concubine to the Sultanah mm -hmm. of Johor, the story of Khadija Hanum. How many uh, minutes? I have 30 minutes or? Okay, I will remind you once you are, your time is going to end and you have 30 minutes starting from now. 30 minutes, okay. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the all organizers of this important conference. I am really happy to be part of the conference. I hope that this uh, important conference will be beneficial to development of Ottoman studies in relation to historiography in the future. My topic is a little bit magazine issue, but is important. Today, I am going to present a paper from the Ottoman concubine to the Sultana of Johor. The story of Hatija Hanum. Hatija Hanum was the last and fourth consort or wife of Sultan Abu Bakar of Johor. Uh, she was of Circassian origin. Uh, uh, there is a dominant view that uh, Abdulhamid II presented uh, the Hatija and her sister Rukaya to Sultan Abu Bakar in some time in the 19th century. And this uh, shows that the, the existence of imperial marriage between the Ottoman Empire and the Sultanate, Sultanate of Johor. Also, this issue is discussed within the framework of pan-Islamism. Uh, but I don't want to discuss the theoretical issues of pan-Islamism. In my presentation, just I want to ask simple question. Was Hatija actually the former Ottoman concubine in the Ottoman Empire harem. To solve this easy question, but not easy, do I will ask more questions. Who was Hatija? When, uh, when and how did she brought to Johor? Uh, when, where did Abu Bakr marry her? What did Hatija do after Abu Bakr passed away in 1895? I wanna introduce my sources. Uh, I have used several sources, uh, Ottoman archival documents, 
Malay hikayat, shayers, shayers. That means uh, hikayat, but in the the poetic form. Uh, and also the English newspaper journals, newspapers published in colonial Singapore, as well as um, the Ottoman and British travel accounts. Uh, what I can say about the sources, actually all my sources don't provide the comprehensive account of the origin, the early life education, and the Ottoman past of Hatija Hanum. Uh, when we look at the Ottoman archival documents, they told about the Abu Bakr visit to Istanbul, 1893, but they don't mention about the mention to Hatija Hanum. When we come to Malay sources, we are a little bit lucky about the Malay sources. They roughly refer to Hatija, but they don't talk about the origin or the early education of Hatija. Because Malay sources are centered on the Abu Bakr, the Sultan of Johor. But luckily I have some English newspapers. They provide a detailed information on, on the life of Hatija in Singapore and Johor, as well as her second marriage to Kamil Bey. Today you hear this name a lot, I think. The Kamil Bey was the former Ottoman consul general in Batavia between 1897 and 1898. Also in addition, the travel accounts Help me reconstruct the story of Hatija Hanum. Just this small design by methodology. I employ the historical analytical method. Uh, I said that I don't have the comprehensive information on the Hatija. That's why I'm using the deductive reasoning and rational estimation. I will um, use some different data and then deconstruct, this, deconstruct and reconstruct the story. Also to solve the, the lack of uh, sources, I will locate the story in the context of Ottoman Johor relations, as well as I will try to like, look at the issue from multiple perspectives. For example, sometimes from the Abu Bakr perspective and sometimes from the Hatija Hanum perspective. Okay, what, why this story is important? When we look at the, the history of Ottoman Southeast Asian relations, the relations are political, uh, intellectual, diplomatic, religious, and militarily since the 16th century. But the, in the pattern of Ottoman Southeast relations, we don't have um, the imperial marriage except the story of Hatijano. That's why this, I think, story is unique in the history of the relations of between two regions. The other issue, this is really interesting, mysterious and the controversial event in the history of Ottoman Johor relations. Actually, Ottoman Johor relations began in the 19th century. It's really late, late date compared to Ottoman Achenese relation that started in the mid middle of 16th century. That's why it's, uh, I think, important to look at uh, this story. The other issue, the, the story of Hatija uh, has not received enough attention in the literature. We have many, um, not many, a few studies on Rukaya Hanum, her sister, but no Hatija Hanum. Proferid also lastly wrote about the Rukaya Hanum and then Rukaya Hanum was your grandmother, big, big, <laughs> big, big, yeah. Well, Malay say busar or what? <laughs> big, yeah, yeah, big. But in the literature, the subject is full of many generalization, assumptions, and myths. Inshallah, I will try to sort this issue and then I will answer the generalization, assumption, and myths. Okay. Uh, firstly, I want to make uh, some, some terminological remarks. 
uh, for example, if you look at the Malay sources, Ikayat Johor or Shahir Abu Bakar, we can see the, um, the spelling of Hatije, Che Hatije. I think Che means uh, Tatin or Lady or, or this kind of things. And also in the sources, they call her Sultana Hatije. Okay, this word difficult. Pramashuri, Pramashuri, correct? Pramashuri, a queen. Queen, yeah, Pramashuri. And also in the English sources, uh, they call her Sultana of Johor, Hatija, uh, the, the Dowager Sultan of Johor, or ex Sultana of Johor. But strangely, they call her also Inche Ketika, Inji Ketika. I, I came across two, uh, two versions of spelling Hatija. I think they want to say the Hatija, but they cannot spell, and then they spell Katiga, like Katika means like the third in Malay. But in reality, it's a Khatija. But sometimes also it must be Inje Katiga, what they call Inje Katiga. I think this is a problem. I think until now, maybe some researchers come across this kind of terminological problems. As well as we, when we look at these uh, terms, Che, Hati, uh, Hanum, Sultana, Dowager, Ex Sultana, uh, refer to social status in society. Uh, for example, Hanum in Turkish uh, literature and in Malay uh, Malaysia, I think Malay word means the adult woman. And then it's also important to to understand the society the, based on the social status. Okay, my first question: Who was Hatija Hanum? Actually, we don't have enough sources when and where she was born. And I assume that when she married to Abu Bakr, she was married to Abu Bakr, she was 30 years old. Because when you see the picture in the beginning, it she looks like 30. And then this picture was taken in 1894. That's why I assume that she was born in 1860s. And then she was from Circassia. You can see the Circassia, the map the below. This is Circassia. In Russia, they call Cherkes, the Turkish people call Cherkes, same similar pronunciation. Possibly, I assume that again, she, she was Sunni Muslim. She was Sunni Muslim, but some people say the Ottoman harem didn't uh, get uh, Sunni Muslims as a slave girl or concubine. But 1860s, there was a Russian uh, conquest of Circassia. Uh, after that, the Circassian people immigrated to Anatolia. You can see the Istanbul and the north, northern part of uh, Anatolia. It means that there was an increase of Circassians in Turkey and uh, after the mid 19th century. I, at that time also, the Circassian slaves were very popular in the Ottoman Empire. They were slave girls in the high class palace, even if Ottoman Empire, when you look, look at the Ottoman sultans, they had a lot of Circassian wife and concubine. This is the background of the Circassian slaves. Okay, until now, in the literature, we don't have uh, written evidence on the origin of Hatija. This is strong evidence on the origin of Hatija. The Dowager Sultana of Johor, led by yesterday French mayor on a visit to her home in Circassia on 16 June 1897. And then she returned to Singapore to on 21st September 1897. And we are sure that she was of Circassian origin because she visited her home with her daughter under the guardianship, Sayyid Mohammed al Sakov after the Abu Bakr passed away in 1895. After that, I will use this uh, evidence to improve my theory or hypothesis. Okay, the second question. When did Sultan Abu Bakr marry Hatija? There are three different dates. First, 24 February, 1891. The second date is 1892. The third date is uh, 22nd September, 1893, 
in Istanbul. Okay, I will start the the third um, argument. Sorry. Uh, we know that from the Ottoman archival documents, Abu Bakr visited uh, Istanbul between uh, April and May 1893. And you can see the picture. First, he visited the Egypt, and then he met uh, some Ottoman, Ottoman officers. And this picture is from this, uh, her, his visit to Egypt. After that, I think he arranged his, his uh, visit to Istanbul and then prepared to visit to uh, Constantinople. And then he was in Istanbul 24th or 25th April, uh, April 1893. And then he stayed there one month. After that, he moved to Vienna, Australia. And then we have one document. And then he visited the Ottoman consulate in Vienna. And he thanked to Abdul Hamid II for the, his uh, kindship, hospitality, or other things. But we know that he was in Europe. After that, he moved to Europe. He's a great traveler. He's traveling a lot. It's difficult to locate and map his travels where he is. And then he was in Europe in September to get treatment. But he was uh, get treatment 22nd September 1893 in Europe. It means that he cannot, I think he's in Europe, he cannot marry the, to Abu Bakr, the Hatija, because he, he get, uh, got treatment in Europe. We have some, so, uh, some evidence from the English newspapers coverage. Also, why did Abu Bakr marry Hatija in a city far from Johor? Because uh, she she would was to become sultana, uh, she, he must arrange the marriage ceremony in Johor. Correct. That's why I think this argument is uh, not true. And uh, second argument, the uh, Turkish scholar Mehmet Özay and Saltuk said that the, she was married to Abu Bakar on 24 February 1891. But we know that Sultana Fatima, the third of uh, third wife of Abu Bakr, passed away on 25 February 1891 in Singapore. During that time, Abu Bakr was in uh, during his Europe visit, and Fat Sultana Fatima telegrammed to him, "I am sick," and then come back, and then. But after that, she became very well, and then Abu Bakr came to Johor on 15 April 1891. I think this marriage will be after 15 April 1891 because Abu Bakr was not in Johor. And then also the Sultan of Fatima passed away. He didn't attend uh, her funeral. That's why I think this argument also not sound. I, I, su I strongly believe that Abu Bakr married Hatija after 15 April 1891, or, or, but again, not before the 24th or 20, after 24, yeah, like this. Also, we had Abu Bakr had a lot of visitors from Europe, and then these visitors from the United States and Britain, they visited his palace, and then they wrote their travel accounts. For example, one American lady, Bentley, stayed in the Palace of Abu Bakr on 15 March 1892. When she mentioned the death of Sultana Fatima, but she didn't refer to Sultana Hatija. And then you can see the reference the, in the English newspapers, two days in a king palace on 10 June 1892. But again, I said this marriage will be made after April. Maybe. I don't know this uh, lady didn't see or didn't mention this issue. But I am sure it will be after 15 April 1891. Okay, this one, the, another another evidence. In Jakatiga, Abu Bakr's beautiful Circassian wife. I can quote Istana Zahara or Woman Palace, 
were reigned supreme over 150 women. Abu Bakr's beautiful Circassian five in Jakatiga, it means Hatija, uh, in the Johor and its Sultan uh, on 21st February 1893. We know that uh, before Abu Bakr visited the Istanbul, he already married to Hatija. It means that the Abdulhamid II didn't give Hatija to Abu Bakr, not this 1893 visit. Before that, she was available after Sultan of Fatima passed away and then married. So he married to Hatija. And another issue. Sometimes some scholars defer to marriage issue. They married the, the, on 38 February 1894. But at that time, she became the Sultan of Johor. It means that there is a difference between the, the wife of Hatija and Sultana of Johor. She first became the wife of the Abu Bakr. And then maybe two or three years, years later, she became the Sultana of Johor. And then we know that in the Astana Zahara Palace, they, uh, they arranged the ceremony for the Sultana of Johor, but just the Johor royal family uh, attended this, uh, this, this ceremony. Also, when we look at the Ikayat Johor, in the Malay uh, quotation there, I will, I will read it in English. And when the Sultan of Fatima passed away, Enji Khatija, one of the Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr wife, be elevated to Sultana on 28 February, 1894. We can understand from this quote, quote she became first wife after that Sultana. But I don't know why why did she become Sultana three years or two years later after the marriage? Why Abu Bakr waited for waited the, for these three years? I don't know this issue, but I cannot also assume. Maybe later in my paper, I will clarify this issue. Uh, this one no need. These one pictures are for Abdul Hamid, this, the second Hatija, third, the Abu Bakr, fourth one, Rukaya, her sister. I have 10 minutes. Also, when we look at the, 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 her name, Hatija and Hanum, Hatija looks like, Hatija, I think is common in the Muslim world, but Hanum is a Turkish. Uh, it means that adult woman. Uh, we know that the, in the Ottoman Imperial Harem, when the Ottoman slave girl became free, they generally prefer to take new name. It means they want to start the new life. And then they choose the names from the family of the prophet, like the Hatija or Rukaya and other things. Maybe this Hatija as a name show that they are Ottoman connection, but still they are not, uh, I mean, they are not strong evidence. We must, historians look at the written evidence a lot, I think. But again, the, this is important evidence. But when we look at the Ottoman archival documents about the Sultan Abu Bakr visit to Istanbul, no reference to Hatijanu, even if once. They don't mention about Hatijanu. Also in the 1893, one Ottoman traveler, Mustafa bin Mustafa, visited Chor Palace. Strangely, this uh, Sayyid Mohammed al Sakov. Uh, meet him and then introduce the Mustafa bin Mustafa to Abu Bakr. And then this Ottoman traveler met him and then they went to Johor from Singapore. And then the Ottoman traveler said, we have really good uh, discussion and speech for a long time, but he didn't mention Hatijanum. He mentioned the taste of durian. It was like garlic or, you know, he talked about mangosteen really sweet. 
when this issue comes, all people are silent. You know, they, they don't want to talk this the origin of Atija. I don't know this Mustafa bin Mustafa. I mean, okay, I look at the problem from my perspective. I am going to Johor and then this Hatija was from Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. And then this Mustafa meet the all important figures in the relations of Ottoman Saudi Asian uh, connection like the Sayyid Mohammed al Sagov Abu Bakr. But they didn't talk about Hatija. So also, other strange thing: this uh, traveler presented his uh, his uh, travel account to Abdulhamid II in 1984, 1894. If this is imperial marriage or a part of pan-Islamism, I think it's a good political strategy. You must say, okay, we gifted the Hatija to to Abu Bakr, and now you must use this, correct? In the, when we look at the sources, this is really good political uh, tool, I think. But this Mustafa bin Mustafa for I think, love Durian and then <laughs> talk about Durian a lot. But it's, uh, it's okay, this travel account is important, just. <laughs> okay, the third evidence. Oh, I have five minutes. Maybe just I will focus on the, uh, the marriage issue. Uh, Abu Bakr, uh, Abdulhamid II has the Yildiz photograph album. In the album, I think a thousand of photos of the Ottoman Empire, Malay world. I think these uh, Abdulhamid collected these uh, in 1890s. You can see the image. In the album, I come across the image of Sultan Abu Bakr, these two, but no, photos of Hatija. But when we look at the Johor sources, we have good and clear picture of Hatija in the Shail Ermur, Merhum, Sultan Abu Bakr. But when we look at the Yildiz album of Abdulhamid II, we don't have uh, the photo of Hatija. And then after that, I, I think, I think Sultan Abdulhamid uh, respect Abu Bakr. And then that's why he didn't uh, put this, this uh, picture. But after that, I checked the uh, Malay world. He put uh, some princes, queen, and Jariye in the album. Again, no strong uh, discourse on the on the, Hati the origin, the Ottoman past of Hatija in the Ottoman sources. Uh, okay, I come to Johor sources. I have five minutes. Okay, I cannot finish writing, but just I will come to conclusion. This Johor sources also didn't mention Hatija, Hanu. Just they focus on the first class of Ottoman order. You can see in the picture is really the beautiful Ottoman order. You can see in the Shahir al Marhum, Baginda Sultan Abu Bakr in the Negeri Johor. Just they mentioned Bintang Osmanlı, Osmanlı or Bintang Osmani, but they didn't talk about. Hatija Hanu. Again, in another source, Hikayat Jor also mentioned the uh, first class star from the Abdul Hamid. And then they didn't talk about uh, Hatija. Okay, English newspapers. There is a one article dated 21 February 1893, mentioned Hatija as a beautiful Circassian wife of Abu Bakr. Again, no reference to her Ottoman past. What they talk, the ones from Turkey, rocks from Bukhara, gifts from the king of Italy, the Shah of Persia, the Sultan of Turkey. The article mentioned the gifts from Sultan of Turkey as well as the ones so far from Turkey, but they didn't mention her Ottoman linkage. This is another evidence. Okay, what is the alternatives? How we construct this story? Before I, we know that the Abu Bakr had 150, some people say 40 Circassian girls. It means that he had a Circassian slave girls or concubine in the harem. Maybe Hatija was one of Circassian women in the palace. And we know that in the 19th century, the important cities of the Ottoman Empire, like Cairo, Istanbul, we have the slave markets. 
and circadian movements were available and dominant. Maybe the Abu Bakr or Sayyid Muhammad al sakaf bought this Hatija from there. And then maybe we can give the data. On average, annual imports amount to 12,000 slaves, about 87% of them African. 13% Circassian or Caucasian. It means some of them Circassian, some of them Georgian. It means that we had really big slave trade in the Ottoman Empire. Slave trade of Circassian women. Okay, I don't go to details of the how she can she she was bought from Circassia, how she came, maybe later if I get question, I will answer this. Third alternative is her sister Rukaya maybe first came to Johor and then she demanded the, her sister to bring Johor. We know that the Florence lady visited Johor Palace and then saw the Rukaya. And then she described Rukai, the called Rukaya Turkish lady. However, she couldn't speak to the European language. Maybe this Rukaya feel uh, alien to culture or other things. But before I said there are there were many Circassian girls in the the in the Johor harem. Maybe I don't know. Maybe she a little bit bored or something because different culture. Maybe she demanded her to bring the Johor palace. Okay. When Abu Bakr passed away, she became Dowager Sultan of Johor. Dowager means a widow who, whose husband passed away, but had a rich inheritance from the husband. And then she stayed in Istana Budnik in Singapore. And also she passed away there in, on 1st February, 1904. Okay, how many minutes I have finished already? I think uh, it is the time for you to conclude. Okay, after the Abu Bakr passed away, she married to Kamil Bey Ottoman consul uh, on the between 24, 27 December 1898. And then they moved to Constantinople and then they lived there. After that, the Abu um, Kamil Bey was appointed to, to Liverpool as an Ottoman consul. And then she moved to uh, she moved to Liverpool. But we know that from the English sources. She came back to Singapore and then she missed uh, her children. And then she didn't want to go to uh, Constantinople, Constantinople or Istanbul. And then she speak with uh, other passengers on the ship. And then she said, I don't know a great desire to return anytime to Constantinople. But she returned to Liverpool. But we don't know she had maybe family problems. I think she missed her two children by Abu Bakr. Tuku Aziza and Tuku Fatima. That's why she cannot adapt to this uh, situation. Maybe she divorced Kamil Bey and then come back to uh, Singapore and then pass away in Singapore. We know she passed away in Singapore on 1st February 1904. Her grave was in the Telopalanga, Tele Singapore. And okay, this is the last, last picture. This is really a clear picture from the I think Dutch archive. And then the, these are uh, Nantian Piet, Indonesian Chinese, describe Hatija. Not only was she apparently not at all fat, but also she was very white, her facial beauty being incomparable. And this uh, Indonesian Chinese author said she was like a European uh, woman, white face, and then uh, she was not really gemuk and fat. <laughs> he said, he said yeah, I don't say, yeah, this is not my <laughs> description. <laughs> These are non PH say like that. Okay. I think it's good. Just maybe last point. We must reconsider the Ottoman Jaw relations from the new perspective and new material sources. There are lots of uh, assumption, myths, generalization, and outside document and sound. Uh, arguments, we can look at uh, the history of Ottoman Jewish relation from the multiple perspective and from the new sources. It, I hope also the, there are lots of Circassian slave girls in Johor Halem. Maybe in the future, it's hoped that some researchers look at these Circassian girls from the history 
from below, from the perspective of circulation curves. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very typhoon. Uh, I'm, I hope we have learned something new from this session. So um, for now for the question and answer session, if you have any questions, you can turn on the mic and please be brief. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, very interesting. Um, I have many questions. Actually, I will ask them very briefly. Uh, firstly, can you explain what you mean by historical analytical method? That's one. Uh, the other questions on on uh, a few points regarding uh, Hatije Hanum. Why do you assume that she's the sister of Rokhi Hanum? Oh, yeah, I don't have enough evidence also. Ah, yeah, that's right. So it's, I think it's just speculation yeah. based on, on yeah. rumors, right? Yeah. Um, and then also, why do you assume she was Muslim? Because many concubines, as you yourself know, but you know better than me, yeah. were non-Muslims who were brought into the harem and then converted yeah. to Islam, right? Yeah. yeah so uh, it's perfectly possible that she was not, uh, both yeah. she and Rukhi Hanum were yeah. not Muslims. Yeah, true. Yeah. So anyway, you, you can discuss okay. that. But uh, regarding when she came, there was a newspaper article you put there, I think February 1893, mm. Straits Times. Yeah. February 1893, was it right? 1893, yeah. February, I don't know which one. Uh, yeah. which, which, which refers to well, I cannot the Circassian Sultana of. Yeah, Beatable Circassian yeah. wife. Yeah. yeah. 1893, I think. Yeah. Okay. Before uh, Abu Bakr went to Istanbul. Istanbul. Yeah. That means that is proof. That's proof that she most likely was not given to Sultan Abu Bakr by Sultan Abdul Hamid. Yes. Right? Yes. Because Sultan Abu Bakr had not gone to Istanbul yet. Yeah, but some people say Sultan Abu Bakr visited to Istanbul in. Three times, correct? Well, I think we can say this is definitely not true. Yeah, okay. Because of the, the account of his visit um, in some of the sources, where Sultan Abu Bakr says he has never met yeah. Sultan Abdul Hamid before. He wants to meet him for the first time. When he was in Egypt, he was saying this. Yeah. I think in April. Uh, April and May, yeah. April, uh, no, bef just before. Yeah. He traveled in April. He was in Cairo and he was mentioning how he has never been to Istanbul. He has never seen the Sultan yeah. and so on. Yeah. So it means that he she was given she 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 was brought to Johor in an, in another way. Yeah. Right. It also strengthens the, my argument that Ruki Hanim was also not given by Sultan Abdul Hamid, but came to Johor in another way. Yeah, Sayyid Muhammad Al Sakaf. That's what I think. Yeah, I think so because Sayyid Muhammad Al Sakaf. We know that already. Johor Harem had a lot of Circassian girls. And then we know that after the mid 19th century, we there is a big slave trade between Circassia until to India. There is a one article in Cairo, for example, we can see the Circassian slaves there. And then they came from, actually, maybe we must talk how they came to Johor. We must explain the slave trade. Actually, there are two kinds of slave traders. One is slave, source slave dealers, the other market slave dealers. Source slave dealers went to Circassia, bought the woman there, and then brought to Istanbul, sell in the slave markets. These market slaves went to Istanbul, bought the slaves, and then brought them to the Cairo or Damascus or Yemen, and then they sell these Circassian slaves in these places. Maybe we know that this uh, Malay world always had a connection with this Middle East. Also, Sayyid Mohammed Sakaf had a company, the ship company, El Sokov company. Maybe Sayyid Mohammed brought both this woman and then others also, other Circassians, and then brought them to Johor. This shows that also the, the slave trade between the Circassia and Cairo extend to Malay world. We can say this kind of things, but of course, I don't have uh, enough research on this issue. I must make another, I, I must carry out another research, the slave slave trade between. Was there a Circassian slave trade in, in Malay world? Yeah, I, yeah, there are, Johor Harem had 
30, 40 Circassian girls. Mm -hmm. There is a one American uh, visitor. He's, he said in the Johor Harem, there were 40 Circassian girls. I think we know that these uh, market slave dealers they run the business, not just the slave business. They also sell another community until the India. Maybe the trade came to until the Malay world or this uh, Johor family went to Cairo. We know that they always go to Cairo and uh, Makkah. They bought the slave girls from there and then brought to here. You see, all this will make my family very angry. Yeah, I know. If they were, I am so sorry. <laughs> because because the, the idea has been all along that these two ladies were given by Sultan Abu Bakr. Yeah. Given by Sultan Abdul Hamid II to Sultan Abu Bakr. And I think now what you, you are suggesting and also what I, I suggest in my own uh, research that they could not have been given by him because yeah. they came before he left, before he went to Istanbul. Yeah. Before yeah, it's Sultan Abu Bakr went to Istanbul. It's clear because in the Kayat Johor, yeah. they said when Sultan of Fatima passed away, one of the one of uh, the Abu Bakr wife, one of the women of Abu Bakr, became the Sultan of Johor, correct? After the Sultan Fatima passed away, she became the wife. But we have, I think, enough evidence to uh, persuade your family. <laughs> Yeah, historical analytical method. Actually, this is a, I collect a lot of data from the different sources. I check their authenticity, originality, and then I ask different questions to sources. And then I try to reconstruct the story. Yeah, this one historical analytical methodology. Actually, this is little bit narrative inside because the story pushed me to narrate this story. After that, I must be analytical. I must understand the story in analytical way. Also, I can put maybe this, I must discuss the pan-Islamism issue. I don't discuss here pan-Islamism. She, she came here by the, the pan-Islamism issue. I don't discuss uh, here. Maybe we can put pan-Islamism as a theoretical framework in this paper, maybe later. Thank you so much for your suggestion. Yeah. All right, take one. I have a question with related to the professors. Uh, as you said, there are uh, there were forty Caucasian lady. Mm -hmm. So why they uh, choose to just these two ladies as a uh, sultana? Why the Abu Bakr? Why not others? She's pretty. <laughs> correct. In the victim, we cannot share. She's really the correct. It's the occasion. I think that's why they choose. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I think, uh, uh, can I just ask one question? Yeah. So all these things we are talking about uh, historical narratives and all that, right? What's missing? Or I've been thinking about is why there's been this distortion, generalizations, myths, and all that. So I think, you no, know, maybe you can elaborate. Maybe you can speculate on why there has been yeah. this kind of distortions being done over the story of Khadija. Then you can also. Yeah. Maybe consider changing the title of your paper to the myth of Adidia. Yeah, no. Maybe the myth. We yeah. must, uh, yeah, you are right. We must research how this uh, myth happened in the historiography of Ottoman Johor relations, or in particular, we must check all the secondary sources. Who said this argument first, and then how we that how this uh, narrative developed? I think this uh, myth developed after the after the independence of Malaya or after this Dato on Jafar, correct? Dato on Jafar visited Istanbul to uh, try to get information about her. He's a grandmother. Maybe yeah. Hussein, Hussein, sorry, yeah, Hussein. Maybe after that, this one uh, developed. Because when you look at the contemporary sources, primary, contemporary primary sources, they don't mention the, the her. Uh, brother, assalamu alaikum. I, I would like to share uh, an observation, yeah? Yeah. Because when you put it at like an imperial marriage, it's yeah. as if the Ottoman and Johor is on the same part. It is not. Ottoman is an empire. Yeah, Whereas yeah, Johor right. was actually a state that was developed during that time as a breakaway from the empire of Johor Riau. Yeah, you are so right. they were trying to get legitimacy, you know. It yeah. is not equal, actually equal. So perhaps, perhaps the reason the narration later become as imperial marriage of equal. But it is not equal, actually. Ottoman it's, it's a matter of prestige also. 
Yeah, you are right. Because yeah. when the Abu Bakr visited the Istanbul, you know that Abu Bakr has a travel strategy. He want to travel and then he want to be recognized as a sultan, correct, from Maharaja. He, does, he didn't accept. He want to be sultan. That's why he visited Europe. William Blunt said that the, the main uh, purpose of Abu Bakr visit to Istanbul is to be recognized as a sultan. But Ottoman Empire said, you are sultan just in the Malay world. Not <laughs> or <laughs> because he's, he was actually supported by the British, like yeah. I said, he was a Temungung at that time. It yeah. is uh, one of the officials, but later on, with the help of the British, he was really up to become Sultan. So, yeah. that's, yeah, uh, that's yeah. Story another, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for the questions. I believe this is such a controversial <laughs> issue. <laughs> I'm very nervous. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we are, uh, I believe that we have come to the end of the session. Um, I shall pass the floor to the brother Adam and thank you, brother Typhoon. Yeah, thank, thank you for your uh presentation. So I pass the floor back to, to me. Adam. No, give. Let's wait for brother Adam, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's controversial. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now, really, we need to appreciate why we need this conference. Yeah, because in this conference, we talk of unthinkable and we try to understand what happened and maybe correct the narrative. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, the presenter and I would like to thank also the Madam Moderator. Can we give them some? Uh, before I let you go, uh, we are supposed to have a tea break, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, the organizers still uh, they still want you to to go for more some two rounds uh, before you can have a heavy <laughs> a tea break inshallah uh, so we are going to continue uh, with the next session that will be beyond pan islamism you've been talking about the issue of pan islamism understanding the ottomans caliphate southeast asian policy so before I release you, inshallah, uh, pardon, pardon. we are going to give you a, uh, uh, a gift. Pardon? Anything? Okay, so inshallah, we can have the gift session and when we, then we go to the next. Please, we can start with the presenter. <laughs> So inshallah, the next session, our moderator, our moderator for this section, uh, this session is going to be Mr. Sohail Marjani from uh, Asia We. <laughs> inshallah. And our speaker is going to be Dr. Adaldin uh, Tekin, Department of uh, History, Social Science, University of Ankar. Uh, so please uh, welcome. So allow me to present this session uh, to the moderator, uh, Brother Sahil. Please welcome. Um, Salam alaikum and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I Apology in advance if I, we are ruining your tea break. <laughs> um, so without further ado, for this session, I would like to introduce Dr. Aladdin Tekin. Uh, he's currently a lecturer in history program at Social Science University of Ankara, Turkey. 
He received his PhD degree in, uh, in history and civilization from IIUM Kuala Lumpur. He teaches and publishes in the field of Ottoman and Southeast Asia history and his philosophy. A significant part of his current work is on Malay world and Turkey. Should I call it Turkey? Yeah, Turkey. Turkey, yeah. He has published several articles about the Ottoman and Southeast Asia, such as uh, Restoration of uh, Real uh, Sultanate Ottoman Relations, 1857 to 1904, the Indonesian um, Hadramese cooperation with the Ottoman and the sending of Indonesian students to Istanbul from 1880s to 1910. Uh, Turkish Waqf after uh, the 2004 uh, Aceh tsunami. And uh, his last study is about the Ottomans and the Malay Sultanate and of the peninsula for UN press. So your topic for today would be on um, beyond pan-Islamism, unveiling the Ottoman Caliphate's relation with Southeast Asian Muslims. And I think it would be a very interesting topic because of course, this firstly is about, um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's about, it's here, sorry. It's about uncovering the historical factors regarding the relation between the Ottoman Caliphate and Muslim in Southeast Asia. And secondly, it would be more interesting for me is because of your name. I love Aladdin. Yes. <laughs> My childhood favorite character. He's Arabic, huh? Yeah. You're so, from? I'm from Iran. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But no worries. Aladdin is, ever, is uh, all, I think, uh, Middle Eastern's favorites. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I will just leave this issue. And thank you so much for your introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, actually, I decided to talk about. And I will try to draw a general relations between the Ottomans and the Malay world for your audience. Because when we look at each topic, they are very specific. And that's why I decided to give a general idea that the relations which were occurred in the 16th century and until the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And limit, uh, due to the, my limitation of time, I would like to start now and uh, we have been discussed to create this program, especially for Farid Alatas, but due to some uh, like such COVID-19 and other uh, developments, we could not issue it. But with the support of IRSICA, we are handled issue to organize this program. And during my presentation, as you can follow my uh, slides, you will be very helpful to you. And I divided the topic into two parts. In the first part, I will talk about hot power, which was occurred Aceh, Kda, Riyayu, and Jambi. Then I will talk about the soft power relations of the Ottomans with the Malay world, especially at the beginning, at the late of 19th century to the uh, first quarter of the 20th century. So, firstly, uh, Sometimes it's really hard to summarize this kind of relations in a limitation time, and inshallah, I will try to do my best. And to better understand the relations between the Ottomans and the Malay world, we have to go back to the 16th century when everything started here. Uh, with the, the fall of Mamluks by the Ottomans in 1517, and the control of Aden in 1538, the Ottomans reached the Indian Oceans and its borders stretched from the middle of the, uh, Europe to the Indian Ocean. Due to this Ottoman expansion in the Indian, Indian Ocean and, and South Arabia, and in the same years, the Portuguese also expanded its policy to the India and they invaded some part post in India and Malacca in 1511. With this purpose, the Sultan of Gujarat requested help from the Ottomans to uh, help them to expel Portuguese from the India. And the Ottomans prepared four different expeditions to expel Portuguese, but unfortunately, this all expedition will not succeed, but the Malay world meet with the Ottomans as a result of this expedition. So, when we look at the 1560s, the, the first relationship between the Ottomans and the Malay archipelago, which was occurred in Aceh. 
when Portek is start to expand its border towards Sumatra and Java, one of the most dominant and powerful Sultan, Alauddin Riyad Shah of Aceh, sent a delegation to Istanbul and requested help from the Ottomans against their common enemy, I mean, Portuguese. And interestingly, the Ottomans look this demand as very positively, and they decided to help Achenese for their fight against the Portuguese. When we look at the, they requested from the Ottomans, the Sultanate of Aceh, Alauddin Riyad Shah, wrote in his letter that if the Ottomans sends a flat to help them, they can defeat this infidel, I mean, Kafi Portuguese in his letter. And Ottoman replied that they decided to send a total of 15 galleys, two galleons, seven artillerymen, enough military engineers and masters, as well as gunpowder cannons, rifles, and other tools and equipments to be sent Aceh from the Ottoman Suez port. This is a really big decision for the Ottomans to send a huge navy to the Malay world for their fight and jihad against the Portuguese. But some unexpected developments occurred when Ottoman decided his uh, decision and some rivalry in Yemen and need to conquest of Cyprus and Tunisia the Ottomans decided to postpone a few times to send this huge navy, but they decided to send two military aid ships to Aceh. This is really also important because it's as a kind of military technology transfer from the Ottomans to the Malay world. And because the, in this years, the Ottomans was the most powerful country in the world and they have the military technology. In these two ships, when we look at what they carried out, especially they ported from Suez around Egypt, and they carried gunpowders, big cannons, and military engineers and masters to teach local people and soldiers to need this technology transfer. And this transfer also uh, occurred some traditional Malay literature as a tale of Lada Sechupak, one of the big biggest canon, and Professor Gyoksoy translated this hikayat. So I catch these pictures from a movie which were produced by Javanese a few years ago. I think the name of this movie is Sultan Agung. And as you can also see this movie, the Ottomans start to teach this new technology to the local soldiers because their enemy has already this technology. And with these rifles and the cannons, the Ottoman Caliphate was an alternative power for the Muslims in the Malay world. And also these all uh, events and transformation will occur to some hikayas, uh, hikayas. So this is some example uh, of the Ottoman cannons uh, in Aceh and Sumatra, when the Dutch expats from the Sumatra, they brought this kind of huge cannons to the to, to in uh, Netherlands, and they're exhibiting in a museum named Brombeck History Museum. So interestingly, when everything was going well, the relationship between the Ottomans and the Malay was were interrupted around 300 years. And I can explain why this happened because one of the most important reason can be long distance between the two regions. And the can be reason lack of common interest between the two regions, especially when the Portuguese expats from the Malay world. And Ottomans entered a period of stagnation and the burning of Ottoman Navy by crusaders and the death of some dominant figures such as Alauddin Riyad Shah Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent and his son Sultan Selim II. And due to these factors, the, the, the relations, the diplomatic relations and hard power relations ruptured around 300 years. But interestingly, when we look at the first quarter of the 19th century, the Sultan of Kedah, Ahmed Tajuddin Halim Shah, also uh, Professor Kadir translated these documents to English. And when this, there, there was no any interstate relationship between the Ottomans and the Malay world, 
the Sultan of Kedah sent a letter to, uh, to Istanbul and requested a help for, against the Siamese. According to Professor Akli Kader, because the Ottomans did not reply to this demand, and according to Kader, he introduced that, he said that the Ottomans were very busy due to the Greek rivalry in the same year. But one, there can be one reason that, because until this time, the local sultanates in the uh, Malay world, they requested to help from a Western country and colonial country, but in that time, they requested to help against the Siamese, which was not very well known by the Ottomans. Most importantly, he introduced himself in this letter that I was the Sultan of one of the Java people, which is the Banat Equator called Kada. And the imagination of the Ottomans in Kada also can be seen in Kada Anas and Hikayat Marang Mahawasanga. So, until the middle of the 19th century, I'm trying to summarize all this relation inshallah, in 30 minutes. And when we look at the middle of the 19th century, the Ottomans and the Malay world relations were established again with the aim uh, of, again, uh, the request and help from the Ottomans for this time against the Dutch. And also this map also was translated by Kader, uh, and it, it was sent also in the same year to Istanbul. And Sultan Ibrahim Mansur Shah of Aceh reminded the relations of the 16th century uh, in 1850. And Sultan Mansur Ibrahim Shah could reestablish the diplomatic after long rapture. And Habib Abdurrahman al Zahir also is one of the dominant figures who was originally Hadrami, and he had a mission to send Istanbul, and he created a lobby uh, against the Dutch and British in Ottoman diplomacy and press. Just like Sultanate of Aceh, Sultanate of Riyadh and Jambi had also a mission to send some delegation or letter to Istanbul to request a help from the Ottomans against the Dutch. Uh, especially in the first quarter of the 19th century with the Treaty of Anglo-Dutch and London, the British and the Dutch divided the Malay world into two parts and they shaped this um, world between each other. After this kind of treaty, the Dutch start to expand and innovate uh, to Sumatra and Java. And with this purpose, some sultanates were very uh, uncomfortable with the situation and they threatened and they requested again to Ottoman, just like Sultanate of Aceh. And Sultan Emir Ali Jafar of Riyadh sent a letter to Istanbul in 1857 and Sultan Taha Seyfettin sent a letter to Istanbul in 1858. They generally wanted to be a vassal state under the Ottoman Caliphate. Why they did this decide? Because they believed that if they can be a vassal state under the Ottoman Caliphate, they sure that the Dutch will not invade their lands. So, and here I will change the policy, uh, the Ottomans changed their policy from hard power to soft power because the Ottomans understood that there were many demands from the Malay world, but they could not give uh, a reflex as they did in the 16th century. And the Ottomans were no, no longer the Ottomans of the 16th century. And there were many rewards. Uh, against the colonial countries such as in Sumatra, Java, and Peninsular Malaysia. However, these rewards were unlikely to succeed because the colonial powers could easily control this small scale, sporadic, and uncoordinated rewards. In that part, the Sultan of Ottoman, especially Sultan Abdul Hamid II, will create a new policy as such uh, pan-Islamism. And in this part, I prepared to question why the Ottoman decided to develop its soft power in the Malay world. During the especially Ottomans uh, and, and Western countries' wars, they followed a balanced policy between the superpower countries. But with the war of the Russian, in, which it was ended in 1876, the Ottomans understood that they were alone against the Western countries. 
then they decided to contact the Muslims in the Malay world. So the Ottoman's weakening position in Ottoman rivalry since 1880s, the Latin Sultan looked for developing trans-regional influence as an application of pan-Islamism in the Malay world. And the second question is uh, the most important one. Why did the Ottoman Caliphate need implement this policy in the Malay world? The Ottomans actually knew very well this world, which had the large Muslim population here. And the Ottoman presence was demanded in the region due to the diplomatic background with Aceh, Riyadh, and Jambi. And here we will talk about, I will talk about the Ottoman South power policy in the Malay world. Khalif, I mean, Caliphate could be a spiritual leader for the Muslim in around the world. And as you can see the picture, one of the local Sumatran were selling uh, Khalif's uh, photograph to local people in Sumatra. And in that part, Sultan Abdul Hamid II used is the pan-Islamism as a means, uh, the South power as a means of pan-Islamism, thanks to the Caliphate. Let me introduce what is pan-Islamism. According to uh, Kamal Karpat, one of the most important Ottoman historians, he described pan-Islamism as a movement of regeneration and modernization, and as an effort to mobilize Muslim, not merely for political and cultural self-defense against Western colonialism, but also self-renewal and process. And pan-Islamism also was generally looked uh, as a realization of the Islamic ideal, the unity of the world in Islam, the central direction under a leader of the world Islamic community. So from especially 1880s to 1910s, Sultan Abdul Hamid II used the title of Khalif as a means of self power in the Malay world. It was actually a message to the Western countries that Islamic world was not alone. And the second message to the Western countries that uh, the Ottoman was not over yet. So with this purpose, the Ottoman, how the Ottomans operated the soft power in the Malay world. There are many groups. The first group, Hadramis, as you know, they migrated from Yemen to the Malay world some centuries ago. They could speak Arabic, they could write Arabic, and they were the subject of the Ottomans. So that's why when the Ottomans start to operate it is South power policy, Hadram is generally the main groups who applied this policy in Java and Sumatra and Peninsular Malaysia. And during the Sultan Abdul Hamid time, he appointed many ambassadors or consuls to Batavia and Singapore. Also, they controlled and followed this kind of policies. The role of Malay and Javanese Hajis, also they are a very important group because the pilgrims to Mecca shaped and influenced each other with the ideas throughout the Ummah. And therefore the Dutch and British wanted to minimize Malay and Javanese Hajis to Mecca and Medina, and they wanted to control them. And the next khutbah, khutbah also is very important, and Ottomans sent thousands and thousands of khutbah network to mosques in uh, Java and Sumatra to read in the name of the Sultan, and they followed uh, pan-Islamism ideas from this kind of khutbas. And the next one, pan-Islamist publication, the major source of dissemination for the Sultan Abdul Hamid II's pan-Islamism policy in the Malay world was the press, including newspapers, magazines, and holy books important from Cairo, Istanbul, uh, uh, and Mecca, and produced, some of them produced also locally, in spite of the most influential Islamist thinkers such as Jamalatin Afghani, Rashid, Rida, Muhammad Abdu. All these publications were systematically criticized the Dutch and British colonial rule in the Malay world. And the last one is education. And by the way, Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II printed thousands of Quran and Tafsir books for the Muslim in the Malay world, and they sent especially to Java. And I will talk about education a few slides later. This is some consulates, except the last one, three of them were Hadrami, but for Professor Kader today talk about Saka was not a consulate. That's why I put a question mark here. And at Allah Bay, when he contacted with some local sultans in Sumatra, he died in a sudden traffic accident uh, in 1903. 
And this is the consulates of Batavia. There is more crowded than Singapore. And except the first one, Said Aziz Baghdadi, also originally an Arab, the rest of them appointed from Istanbul from the center. Those who applied this support most effectively generally accepted as Ali Ghalib Bey and Kamil Bey. So this is the picture which I took when I visited Jakarta. It was the first Ottoman consulate building in central Jakarta. Now it's using as textile museum and some center for Baltic. And this is the uh, education also, especially uh, the, the, Ottoman, the Ottoman consuls start to think we should send some students to Istanbul to take education schools in Istanbul. And this is the, some list of the students. And also we published this article uh, with Professor uh, Dr. Al Alvi Alatas. And when we look at here, unfortunately, the selection students uh, sent to Istanbul was not made in an efficient manner. And the selected students were the children of Hadramis, who known to be close to Turkish consul in Java, and except a few of them who originally Alatta's family, the rest of them generally were not succeeded during their education in Istanbul. So due to the disrupt power policy of the Ottomans, some diplomatic and humanitarian relationship with Istanbul were emerged here in this Malay Peninsula. These were Johor, Patani, Malacca, and Perak. Let me, uh, especially Sultan Abu Bakr uh, of Johor's uh, visit, but is I think under discussions, uh, but it, it influenced maybe Patani uh, and, 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 and Sultan of Brunei because, uh, yeah. Uh, let me talk about here one, for example, in Malacca, uh, when some small security battles took place between the Malay and British soldiers in around uh, Sungai Ujung, thanks to this kind of South power policy, some Malay soldiers uh, hoisted the Turkish flag while, while they were fighting against the British. And another example is that in 1913, uh, the people of Moor, which is less than 50 kilometers from Malacca, donated a huge money to Ottoman soldiers for their fight against the Western countries. And this is from also Johor. Uh, yes, uh, Johor Sultan sent these English documents with uh, his envoys, Abdul Rahim bin Andak Datusri and Madraja. And he presented the following English documents and he declared their loyalty to Khalif uh, and these documents, I think, were also prepared during the Sultan Abu Bakr of Johor. Yes, I talked this one, and, and, and also Perak. Let me talk about some things about Perak. Maybe the people of Malay world had never seen a picture of the Khalif, or maybe they have no any idea about the Pan-Islamism policy. But thanks to this kind of soft power policy, many sultanates start to collect a huge money to, to be sent to Istanbul. For example, this document was prepared in Kuala Kangsar in 1913. And the document is related to that money collected by the Perak Sultan was sent to the Turkish Red Crescent to be spent on the Turkish soldiers who wounded in their wars against the non-Muslim country. And the total amount of this aid was approximately $38,000. So I can extend this kind of sultanates like Singapore, or I can talk about more Johor, but due to the limitation of my time, I would like to go my conclusion that, why did the Ottoman Empire try to implement the Pan-Islamism policy while so many diplomatic relations were established. There can be many reasons about these the issues, but I think the three ones are enough to understand, especially in the 19th century, the Ottoman could not fight openly against the colonial states, especially in a distant country. So that's why the Ottomans switched their policy from hard power to soft power. The second reason can be responsibilities of the Caliphate. As you know, with the fall of the Mamluks, the title of Khalifa transferred to Ottoman dynasty. And it means that if you have a title of Khalif, you have to protect 
the Muslim in around the world, is a protector of Ummah. And the third reason, it was a message to the Western countries that the Ottoman was not over yet. And my last conclusion that, and, um, and, and uh, as I concluded my presentation, I believe this also analyzes very important Ottoman and the Malay roles, and it was diplomatic relations of the most Western and the most Eastern of the Islamic civilization. And centuries ago, our encounter showed us how Islamic countries should support each other when faced with difficulties. For example, the reason for now Palestine remains isolated today because of the loss of the spirit and the power. Thank you so much for listening and hoping regain to repeat again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aladdin Tekin. It was a very, indeed, a very interesting topic. Again, I repeat the topic. It was about beyond pan-Islamism, unveiling the Ottoman Caliphate's relation with Southeast Asian Muslims. And I love how uh, you elaborate uh, the beauty of soft power and its influence and uh, how much it can actually has even more influence to compare with hard powers because soft power is something that is, is a long-term investment. And if you were to engage that, eventually a long time, you would be the absolute winner rather than um, hard power of wars, which is very temporary and, and is devastating. Thank you so much again. And I would like to ask from floor, if there is anyone have any question, please do let us know. We have a very short period of time. Anybody, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to start my question with a bit of background. Uh, I am descended from one of the Pera aristocrat, which were exiled to the Sicils. You know that the, the, in, in Pera, in 1874, they signed something called the Panko Treaty, inviting the British to develop Pera. But instead, uh, the British practically took over the administration, and that it led to the murder of the first British uh, resident. And the Sultan of Perak at that time, the Laksamana, which was my great-great-grandfather, and then there's the Menteri and the Sabanda got exiled to the Seychelles in 1877. In 1895, they were sent to Singapore. In Singapore, uh, the, the Menteri passed away in 18... I can't remember exactly, 1895, and then the Shabanda in 1899. My great grandfather passed away in 1904, and then only the Sultan, the ex Sultan, uh, got the liberty to go back to Perak. So I was wondering, you know, during that period, because the, 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 uh, the consulate in Singapore was established in 1865, yeah? I was wondering, in terms of soft power, or maybe, maybe underground involvement with all the things happening in, in, in the Malay world, yeah, and the British taking over one state after another state. I was wondering what sort of uh, assistance the Turkish uh, Ottoman provide. The soft power is very, very uh, loose term. Perhaps they have sent agents or somebody a plan or something. And I was wondering, you know, because when, when my great grandfather was there, he was practically under house arrest, but he was allowed to do business. But I, I believe that he tried to make contact and to move some resistance. And I believe perhaps they tried to make contact also with the Ottoman consulate, except they couldn't do it directly because they were under observation for all the spies. So I was wondering if you have anything to show some activities like this underground, perhaps. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Yeah, it was very hard to open a consulate in Singapore, which was the center of British colonial rule here. And that's why uh, the Ottomans actually, when they start to send a representative of the Khalif to the region, even though there were many fights in Sumatra and, and, and other islands, especially the Dutch were not very comfortable for this appointment, not British. And the Dutch sent many reports to the British to not be happy about this representative. That's why the Ottomans could not appoint a, a consul uh, in Singapore the, and, and uh, al Junaid and maybe Sakab were an honorary consul in here. And the, the reason Ottomans upon appointed these consuls, the Singapore especially, they have some reasons about this uh, economical and, and, and because it's one of the biggest hub in, in the Malay world. So that's why the Ottomans open here, but the, it's not very active when we are compared to consulates in Batavia because uh, the last Turkish consul uh, were 
died in a sudden traffic accident just two years when after appointed here and there were many discussion about his dying also but i don't want to go to this side but the, the consuls in batavia were very active than singapore and they contacted some local sultans who were fighting against the dutch in sumatra so perhaps is there any possibility that they they are actually coordinating some movements quietly like spies you know uh, actually no that some of them try to explain Kamil they uh, they try to co contact it with leaders and they they wanted to have and some replies and and so on found some uh, hajis baggages which were believed that Ottomans sent this kind of replies to them but the Dutch really controlled the the, the this part and for example due to the pressure of the Dutch the the most one of the most active consul Kamil Bey was not be stay in Batavia a long time and around one and one year and eight months he remote from this position by the Ottomans due to the, the pressure of uh, this kind of Western country because Ottomans in that time was not very powerful. I'm wondering uh, if you I'm sure you are aware that when the the World War First World War uh, started in 1914 and then after some time Turkey joined. It started with Germany, then Turkey joined, yeah. And then I, I think what I read that the Mufti of Turkey gave out a fatwa. Whoever fought against the British, when because the British was already involved, will die a martyr. So actually, it sparked a lot of movement in in the Malay 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 world because of that calling. Yeah. So in response, the British forced the sultans at that time the four sultans under what they call it federated Malay states, yeah. Pera, which is yeah, from also inshallah professor Gyokso, we'll talk about tomorrow this kind of yeah 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 that yeah. was because because the sultan have to issue whoever fights against the british is the hacker against the sultan yeah <laughs> thank you very much for this interesting i'm abu bakar thank god from isika it's a very interesting topic as a uh, not historian come from the legal sciences background when I when the British arrived in the in this part of the Islamic world, where they not where the people not they are already not Muslims, they found Islam here, right? Then if they found Islam here, was there any kind of relationship between the Ottoman Caliphate and the Muslims before the advent of colonial rule? And then therefore there would not have been any need for them to send uh, uh, cons, have consulate or consul because the term consulate general or consul means that somebody who is representing a country in a different jurisdiction. So, uh, so in, in other words, was it that the, the Muslims here, they are somehow independent from the Ottoman Caliphate? And then secondly, one thing that I like about your presentation, and of course, I think the rest of the, who doesn't have been presented, is using the word Caliphate instead of em, uh, empire. The, the Ottomans, I'm not a historian, uh, you will educate me on this, but in my humble opinion, the, inherited the amana that was entrusted to Abu Bakr Siddiq in Medina al-Munawwara immediately after the demise of the Prophet when he was elected or selected or nominated to lead the Islamic world. So after the Sahaba era, you have the Umayyad era, the Abbasid, and then the Ottoman, in my humble opinion, they pick it from the Abbasid as that amana leading the Islamic world, not necessarily as as politician or only political, political and spiritual leaders. How come this terminology comes into our history instead of Khalifid? I know that they were using Sultan, but why not Khalifid? Why, why, why Empire? Thank you. Actually, when I was a PhD student in Malaysia and in my first presentation, I used Empire and many professors gave me many feedback and they were very harsh that should I not, I, I should not use the empire. That's why I decided to, then, since that time to start the caliphate, especially when I talk about the Muslims in the Malaya, because the caliphate is more suitable than empire. And this professor explained me that empire means that a kind of uh, colonial country and sounds of colonial country. Yeah, in this first question, Islam came here first in Sumatra and the peninsula of Malaysia before the Portuguese arrived here. And Islam already have 
in the Malay world, especially in, in Sumatra and Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, but when Portuguese uh, came here, the rest of the Malay world, I mean, especially the east part of the Malay world, and Farid al has also an article about this issue, Islam not yet reached this, uh, the east part of here. But from the 13th and 14th century, Islam already accepted by the sultanates and their independent sultanates, especially in Sumatra, like Pasai. Then the British, when British arrived here in 17th century as a company, Islam completely accepted in the old archipelago. Uh, okay, I think that, um, okay, you got vetoed proper letters. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, um, just a few few issues. Um, did did gunpowder technology, was it first introduced by the Ottomans to the Malay world? So the, the, ca the cannons, when you say they introduced cannons, yes, gunpowder uh, technology. Yes, uh, because when we look at uh, the, the letter of Sultan of Aceh, he especially requested some gunpowder technology from the Ottomans because he explained that we don't have this technology, even though the enemy has already this technology. And we don't know the primary source which was prepared from the Ottomans about this two, uh, military transfer. But when we look at uh, some paper, especially written in the 19th century, there are the, this information uh, explained and the Ottomans sent just not gunpowder, also they sent some experts who can do big walls uh, for the sultanates, and they sent some uh, military engineers and gunpowder. Yeah. And also there are, I think now, uh, Turkish uh, graveyards in Baghdad. They believe that yeah. they, they're from this time, but I don't know. Okay, uh, so I wanted so just to say one thing about the gunpowder. Uh, well, gunpowder uh, as a technology was introduced uh, before the Ottomans' connection with, with here. I think in uh, 14th century, probably I know, in Java, gunpowder technology was used. But uh, what uh, the Achenese wanted from Ottoman Empire is that uh, uh, the technology uh, that uh, cannon because uh, smaller uh, cannons uh, can be found here, but the more uh, the powerful cannons uh, that the Achenese wanted from the Ottoman Empire as well. And also uh, behind this uh, request, uh, we can also, uh, we have to uh, think that because the Achenese uh, uh, tried to expel the Portuguese from the region. So they wanted to uh, help all the Ottoman Empire as the uh, big power at that time. And uh, also uh, in the Arabian uh, shores and Indian shores, uh, there were very uh, a big rivalry between the Portuguese and Ottoman Empire uh, trying to control the uh, trade. So, uh, especially international trade is going uh, through uh, this uh, uh, sea trade. So, the, uh, all these uh, trade were controlled later on by the uh, European uh, powers. Uh, but when I checked some Spanish sources, which were written in the 16th century, the Spanish sources also uh, wrote that the Ottomans teach and sent some replies. Uh, Rifles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Rifles. Uh, which were sent to Ottomans and they start to teach the locals, especially from Inacha, uh, apart from the cannons. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are uh, Ottoman types of uh, rifles and the Ottoman types of uh, cannons. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the uh, in the pictures you have shown, uh, they were produced in Banda Acha, but they are uh, Ottoman types uh, of uh, cannons because uh, 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 Sultan Suleiman uh, sent uh, eight uh, experts, military experts, uh, to Aceh uh, before uh, the Selim uh, the second. So they established the cannon uh, 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 factory in Banda Aceh. So later on, they came. They uh, wanted more experts 
for instance, uh, in different sectors, uh, during the Selim II, uh, experts were sent by uh, Sultan Selim II, and uh, because of the revolt in the Yemen, uh, so the military uh, uh, assistants and the experts were sent with small uh, ships uh, to region. So yeah, that's why okay. I couldn't mm -hmm. give this kind of deep information due to the limitation of my thirty minutes. I think yeah. there is one more, right, Murat? No, I, I didn't. I didn't finish it. Ah. Okay, I have many questions, but I just ask one more. Okay, maybe this is to me the most important. Everyone knows about the the role of the Ottomans in pan Islamic movement in spreading Islamic ideas, reform, right? Um, but what what I, I I am not sure about is what were those ideas? Because for example, in, in the Malay world, we know during that time the the views of Jamaluddin Afghani and Muhammad Abdo uh, Rashid Rida were popular and they were spread, right? But who were the Ottoman thinkers um, in that period whose ideas were spreading in our region? As far as I know, uh, when the Sultan Abdul Hamid II started to implement this policy, Jamal Atina Lafkani visited him and he shaped and he influenced Sultan Abdul Hamid II to apply and implement this policy in around the world. But I think there is no any Turkish scholar uh, who affect and influenced the Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Am I right? I don't know, maybe Professor Kadir Yuksu knows better than me. On a totally different side of the story. I mean, I don't believe there was something like pan Islamism that was uh, something new in the 19th century. I mean, uh, I'm very suspicious about this uh, conceptualization. Uh, because it is the terminology of uh, the colonialist uh, discourse. Uh, without uh, deconstructing the terminology, we can't con deconstruct the entire discourse. Uh, that's why I always try to avoid the use of uh, pan-Islamism. As far as I know, I mean, uh, as a you know Muslim, I, I was brought up as a Muslim, a Muslim Brotherhood or Sa power. Uh, no, I mean, it is not about politics or international relations. Uh, Muslim, being Muslim, means that you uh, are for Muslim Brotherhood, and Muslim Brotherhood is something that you uh, want the solidarity uh, of Muslims uh, you can reach. What is different is that in the second half of the uh, 19th century, there was an early globalization. Uh, I think uh, it is interesting. I mean, this is also a very characteristic uh, of uh, Orientalist uh, uh, way of looking at the Muslim societies is that religious determinism, everything they do is related to their religion. But when it comes to uh, the development in their own universe, it is about, uh, you know, uh, secular uh, yeah, um, material changes around it. Mm -hmm. We have to, I think, emphasize more what is inherent in Islam from the very beginning and what is uh, uh, coming into play uh, in the second half of the uh, 19th century, late uh, 19th century, as what we can call early globalization. This is very much related to many of the topics that we are talking about. Then, uh, 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 the first Achenese that arrived in Istanbul, Istanbul, uh, the Ottoman government didn't know anything about how, where is Ache, how, how it, the, 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 the map you put, yeah. it is just to teach the Ottoman bureaucracy, Ottoman state, how it looks like. And it is probably the first uh, map uh, prepared by locals about Southeast Asia or Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I'm not, uh, I'm not pretty sure. But mm -hmm. the map is for that need. Yeah. And then from then, within a very short period of time, 
you know, very short period of time, you see the establishment of uh, the coastal in Batavia. This develops very fast yeah. I mean, with the introduction of steam. So this early globalization brought uh, the Muslims closer to each other, simply like it brought uh, other people in the world to, to each other. Mm. Uh, the colonialist, the colonial administrations wanted to see it, wanted to see it in this way, and they conceptualized it as a pan-Islamism. Maybe we should not use pan-Islamism, maybe we can use Ittihad Islam or Kassatuan Islam. And it, it, in that case, it is inherent in Islam. It is inherent in Islam. And uh, the 19th century, I mean, the, 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 the very uh, 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 factual uh, problems of the second half of the 19th century and the possibilities, opportunities created by early globalization uh, has brought a new, uh, you know, uh, possibilities, uh, this enabled the Ottomans and we should never, we should never leave aside the internal dynamics of the Ottoman Empire as well. So uh, sometimes Ottoman policy uh, uh, needed to emphasize it's Muslim characters more. Uh, the uh, the caliphates uh, they needed to emphasize more because of internal politics or, uh, around it. So, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> no, was, actually, actually, it was uh, it was my. I'm very sorry my... because okay. if I let everyone ask question, then everybody wants to ask question. I'm sorry, but there is a rule. You would be the last person to ask question. Please make it short. Sorry about it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, uh, just a, 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 a short question. But before before that, uh, I, I would like to brief about my study before I go directly to my questions. Uh, I'm study. I'm looking for uh, the trace of a uh, motif of Ottoman art in architecture, Muslim architecture in Bangkok. Actually, I will I will talk about it tomorrow. Uh, but I think it's a good chance to discuss with you because uh, you are ex uh, you you are talking in this topic. Uh, so mm, the more uh, the, the the two main motifs that we found in Mars and in Mars in Bangkok, we found Ottoman coat of arms and Otto, uh, Ottoman coat of arms called Osman uh -huh. And the second is Tura, the suit uh, the Ottoman Sultan insignia. Uh, so I wonder that how they how how this motif came so far from Ottoman from to, to Bangkok. Okay, we did have a royal visit of Prince Damrong, but uh, another another evidence is that uh, I found a copy of uh, the man in Bangkok. Uh, he is the director of uh, the, a school named uh, Madrasatu Islam. Uh, his name is Sayyid Ibrahim. The letter was sent to Patawia. Uh, was sent to Patawia. Ottoman consulate in, in 1899 to ask for the Sultan uh, a financial support to establish a madrasa in Bangkok. And this, this man, the Sayyid Ibrahim, also requests from, from the Ottoman Empire an amount of a Quran to distribute to other, other religious schools in Bangkok. So my question is go to that. Do you have any records that uh, that set of Quran did have been sent to Bangkok or not? And the second, uh, if it is the subject of the Sultan, it, I mean, it came from the Ottoman Empire uh, on the on the page of the Quran, it it might possibly be a kind of uh, the emblem of the Ottoman coat of arm or the signature of the of Sultan on it, because I guess that perhaps because this Quran was distributed all through Bangkok. So Muslim in Bangkok had seen this, this uh, symbol and copy it as a decorative on their Mars. But uh, like I, uh, we have just only this letter, but I need a solid or concrete evidence to support this idea. Uh, I just asked uh, the old man of the community is in the district of Bangkok Noi. Bangkok Noi is the place that we have a record that this set of Quran from the Ottoman Empire uh, has uh, has been first arrived at, at this uh, district. And from this district, they was distributed to, into other religious schools. 
But unfortunately, there is no concrete evidence because of the World War II, the mosque and, and uh, the surrounding of the community has ruined and destroyed. So if there's supposed to be any Quran from the Ottoman Empire, it was burned. <laughs> So this is the problem. So my my two questions, did it did this Quran set did arrive Bangkok or not? And the second, on the on the Quran, is there any it should be any emblem of the Sunan or Ottoman coat of arms? Thank you so much. Uh, as far as I know, the Ottomans sent Quran to Java. When we look at one of the Ali Ghalib reports. He requested that uh, many, many Qur'ans needed in Java, especially the, the Qur'an should be written by Hattat uh, Shakir Zade and Hattat, one of more Hattat. And he gives some example, this kind of Hattat is more suitable to local people who can read this Qur'an. But I don't know the Ottoman did send any Qur'an specifically to Thailand, but maybe it was transferred from Java to uh, Thailand or, or Patani uh, is, is possible, but we are sure that Ottomans sent with the Ottoman insignia some Quran symbols to Java, and some of examples also were found somewhere in Java. Yeah, South Africa as well. South Africa and Java. There are the... <clears throat> Yes. So they use the same copy, both for Southeast Asia and also in Africa. Um, I'm sorry that I need to cut you. Sorry about it. Um, I, we received more statement than a question for this round. Uh, I believe that the question should be more than statements. Uh, thank you so much for everybody. Thank you so much, Doctor. Please give a round of applause for that guy, Sakin. And we leave the stage to the next. Now, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah once again. Oh, it's just getting heated. Yeah. Uh, and we don't want you to, you guys get overheated, inshallah. <laughs> We have the cooling system here. So inshallah, we are going to have the last one, uh, the last uh, session, and we have a break, and maybe inshallah, we meet tomorrow. Uh, but for now, before I release uh, my, the, the moderator and the presenter, I would like to thank you for the, for the wonderful moment. Inshallah, we are going to, we are going to have some gifts Inshallah, the tradition of Istak will ask Sister, uh, Sister, Sister Wani to, Inshallah, uh, bring forward the gifts, Inshallah. And we'll ask Professor uh, uh, Farid, Inshallah, uh, to take over. Yes, I'm going to do that.
thank you so much. Uh, inshallah, we would like to thank whoever has made this conference possible. We have uh, Amik uh, Irsika, University of Malaya, uh, International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, Asia South, uh, West East Center. We have the National University of Singapore, and we have Baitul Amana. And more important, you, the participants, uh, we thank you for sparing your weekend. We know you'd be doing a lot of other things with family, but you've preserved your time to come here. We also thank you uh, so much. So I'll also request you the last request, our presenters, let's listen to the last session before we can release you to go and do other uh, businesses, inshallah. Uh, our last session for today, uh, it's going to be on uh, the history of Islamic financial innovation from Ottoman Empire to Southeast Asia. So if you, if you notice, today Ottoman Empire has been brought back in Southeast Asia. So what does that mean? They will help us inshallah. Uh, the moderator, Dr. Ismail uh, Zaini, Ismail Zaini from uh, Asia We, please allow me to say that. Then our speaker, inshallah, is going to be uh, Dr. Morad, yes, Institute of Islamic Economics and Finance, Marma, uh, Marmara, Marmara University. Uh, you're welcome. Please take over. A uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all well. 30 minutes, yeah. Um, it's been a wonderful day so far, and we are going to top it off with our very last session on the history of Islamic financial innovation from Ottoman Empire to Southeast Asia. Our speaker today for the last session is Dr. Murad Yash, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Islamic Economic and Finance, Marmara University. He was a visiting fellow at the Institute of Asian, African, and Middle Eastern Studies, Sophia University. Uh, he has been a visiting graduate student at the University of Reading in the UK. His research interest focuses on financial market, Islamic finance, Asian studies. Uh, because we are running behind the schedule, I'm gonna give the floor to Dr. Morat. Yeah, please. New distinguished guests, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I know this is the last presentation, everybody is tired, so I will try to make it uh, as short as possible, but not super short. Uh, at least uh, this is a topic that maybe you can make money, so uh, you, can, you can benefit from history to make money. Uh, I just seen a news yesterday that Malaysian government uh, gave a special budget to INSAF University for an innovation in Islamic economics. So just for that purpose, they give a 20 million ringgit, so around four or five million dollars. So in that sense, uh, this topic is also connected to Islamic financial innovation. So maybe you can take advantage of these research findings. So as a content of presentation, I will start with introduction, then give a very quick literature review and then share my data and methodology. And of course, uh, to talk about Islamic financial innovations in Ottoman Empire, I should give some examples, uh, what kind of Islamic financial innovations Ottoman Empire had, and now how it's evolving in modern Southeast Asia, especially in today's world, Malaysia, Indonesia, how they use the Ottoman Islamic financial products in financial markets, and then I give you a conclusion. So, I mean, uh, especially after 2008 financial crisis, everybody started to blame financial innovations, whether they are used for uh, scamming people or not. And especially after, I mean, last few years, uh, everybody is talking about Bitcoins, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, artificial intelligence, etc. So it has been a, become a part of our daily life. So Islamic finance is also having exposure to uh, these developments. 
in terms of literature, uh, there, is, there are several theories to explain why we have financial innovations, why certain financial products appear and disappear. So evolutionary theories, life cycle theory, economic theories, and institutional theories are some of them. So the lack of single theory also implies that the issue of financial innovations is complex. So there is not just a single explanation why we have a financial innovation. So I mean, how did I decide to choose this topic? That was something interesting for me that the Minister of Finance in Indonesia recently uh, has been awarded with the impactful achievement prize of the Islamic Development Bank. And the product that got this prize was a cash of linked sukuk. So cash of originally goes back to the 15th century of Ottoman Empire that the Islamic financial innovation uh, that occurred in Ottoman Empire 15th century. So I decided to like um, find it like uh, more evidence that these kind of evolutions of Islamic financial institution continue or not. So that is how I uh, got into this topic. So why Ottoman Empire and Southeast Asia? Uh, the normally like the modern Islamic finance developed especially after 1980s and the, the most of these products and theories were like uh, comparing the early Islamic years and today's modern financial markets. So like there was nothing between uh, between like a seventh century and like a 21st century like the like there is like a huge gap of thousands of years like a uh, that that was how uh, many Muslim countries were approaching this topic, but in here I claim like the actual development of Islamic finance continues. There is no gap and it's evolutionary. So why I choose Ottoman Empire and Southeast Asia? The Ottoman Empire was the most developed financial market in its time, and in today's world, the Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and Indonesia especially are the leaders of Islamic finance. And I just shared a very recent report by the United Nations and Islamic Development Bank regarding innovation Islamic finance, just focusing on Malaysia and Indonesia. And these are like Islamic finance development indices and Malaysia and Indonesia number one. So, so these two, uh, like Ottoman Empire, South Asia can be connected in that sense. And so that is how I searching evidence. So, Theory of financial innovations. There are so many theories, so many explanations, but in this study, I'm focusing on evolutionary theory and natural selection. So under evolutionary theory, also there are so many different sub theories. So the natural selection, as you've seen in your biology class, like the strong species, they survive, they adapt to conditions and the weak ones disappear, right? So similar, uh, uh, phenomenon happens also in the financial markets, stronger products survive, they make adaptions uh, based on the circumstances, and the weak ones, they disappear. So the modern literature of Islamic finance, uh, they try to come up with some uh, theories, but uh, actually the literature is so limited. Uh, and there are also some theories similar to conventional uh, financial innovation theories, but the literature in short, I can say it's very limited. Like there is not much study on this issue uh, and methodology. So I am using the historical case studies uh, basically to provide evidence for the evolutionary theory of uh, finan uh, financial innovation. So in here, I provide two uh, case studies from Ottoman Empire, Esam and Keshvakov from 18th century and 15th century, and how these products evolved to, from Esam to Sukuk and from Keshvakov to Keshvakov linked banking practices such as uh, Vakov Microbank in 2017 in Indonesia and My Vakov uh, practice in Malaysia uh, 2019. Uh, another product called Cash Work of Links Cook uh, in Indonesia uh, 2020. So I will try to uh, show how these products are evolved. And of course, uh, first, like uh, to, to claim that a product is specific for Ottoman Empire, it should be also evolved from something else, right? So it is a continuous innovation. So 
from the time of prophet it started with the jizyas haraj and ushur and then the especially in terms of uh, evolution of islamic public finance it continued with ikta in ottoman empire iltizam and from iltizam to malikane they innovated so the 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 reason for that innovation was uh, the iltizam was for short-term financing, like a three, four year maturity, and it was not enough to finance wars. So government needed longer maturity for that product, and they came up with another one. And Assam uh, was also a result of another innovation that government managed the income uh, previously the Malikane system. The, the Malikane uh, owner was... Uh, entrepreneur but in the assam system there is no entrepreneur the government is distributing the return so how the system works uh, just i show in a like simple diagram so originator the ottoman empire they transfer the cash i mean the the re ge return generating income generating assets to treasury and then uh, they issue assam certificates as uh, assam is coming from sehim it means share uh, so the investors subscribe by auction and then the return is paid to investors for lifetime all right so this is how sound works and another case study from ottoman empire cash wakuf uh, how it evolved like normal wakuf was from immovable assets like a lands or buildings so so Ottoman Empire, they had a, like a unique financial markets that Islamic financial, there was very limited Islamic financing institutions and there was a need for alternative institution to banking. Uh, and also there were high interests and loan sharks in certain period of time. And Ottoman had like a kind of socialism, kind of welfare mechanisms, like uh, less in income inequality. So this gave birth to cash wakuf. So the wakuf, uh, has cash money as capital and they use this capital for investment to to make more money for work of activities for philanthropic activities so first of course it started with endowment with the capital of cash and then uh, this money used for investment there are certain products of of course uh, that this cash work of use for financing uh, so in here it's just an example like the borrower sell the assets and get a cash and then lease back and then pay some rents to cash work of and then it then capital is return after they make the principal payment so uh, like it is a work of a foundation based on cash uh, the cash use for investment to make additional return and the return is used for uh, work of activities these philanthropic activities all right this is the system so so how these uh, products evolved into different products in modern Southeast Asia. Now, Malaysia and Indonesia are, can be considered as leader countries in Islamic finance and, and the, how they took advantage of the Ottoman experience. So the Sukuk, maybe it's a, a bit kind of controversial case to claim whether it evolved from Assam or not. Uh, the, the professor Murat Cezakcik, says it's actually kind of co coincidence that they are so similar maybe the even the malaysian uh malaysians didn't notice that it's so looking so similar to ottoman assam but uh, he claims it's originally coming from assam to sukuk so in here also the cash i mean income generating assets are transferred to a special purpose vehicle and then investors subscribe those uh, certificates and then uh, this income generating assets returns are distributed to the investors so it is uh, similar to sukuk uh, but in the case of assam it was a tax return uh, in here it's different kinds of uh, return it can be leasing it can be sale it can be partnership equity so uh, different kinds of uh, asset generation and income generation is possible so second case study is evolution from Cash Wakuf to uh, Cash Wakuf linked banking practice. So this is one example from Indonesia. So the donations are coming to Laznas, this uh, Zeka uh, National Board of uh, Indonesia, and then with that donations they create a bank. All right, with the donations with uh, of the Wakuf they create a bank. It's called 
bank vakıf micro. So it is kind of microfinancing uh, as a bank, but using uh, vakıf cash. So it is kind of cash vakıf mixed with a bank practices. So they are microfinancing poor people uh, with cash vakıf. And the return is distributed to the bank, and then they use this return uh, for the charity activities, or uh, they are financing with lower rates or empowering poor people. All right. So this is one way of evolution of uh, cash vakuf. Another evolution is uh, from Malaysia again. Uh, recently, Malaysia started a value-based uh, intermediation. Uh, practices and in here, uh, or in the uh, initial stage, six banks agreed to join this program, my vakuf program. At the moment, uh, eight banks in Malaysia joined this program: uh, RHB, Bank Muhammad, Bank Islam, Maybank, Bank Rakyat, Afin, Islamic, and now I think uh, CIMB and another bank joined to this program as well. So basically. Uh, Many states in Malaysia uh, uh, and uh, the, the the Islamic authorities uh, they come up with some uh, projects like some kind of Islamic projects. For example, in here uh, they have a housing project uh, from the Penang, and these donations are done by the the depositors of the bank or any account holders. You can make donation, but of course. To reach the the campaign uh, level, uh, it can take time. It can take several months or even a year to reach the target. So, meanwhile, uh, in a special vakuf fund account, these donated monies are invested to make additional money until uh, they can reach the target amount. And then, after they reach the target, they finance the project. So, uh, in here, they use cash vakuf. Uh, People donate money to a certain purpose, and then they make money from that until they reach target. This is like a temporary vakuf until they reach target. This vakuf is closed. Uh, so this is another example from Malaysia. And the last example, uh, this one received the, the price from Islamic Development Bank. Uh, they give $100,000, I think, as price. Uh, for this kind of uh, achievements, impactful achievements. Uh, cash vakuf links to cook. There are temporary vakuf and perpetual vakufs. So their cash are transferred to an agent under LKSPWU. So these are Sharia cash vakuf receiving financial institutions and non LKSPWU. And then BWI is the National Vakuf Board of Indonesia. So on behalf of these vakufs, he's becoming an agent and he is investing all these cash from vakuf to a sukuk. And this sukuk is used for financing public uh, infrastructure projects and the return is paid back to the agent. The, an agent used these returns for philanthropic activities again. So these are all uh, case studies uh, that shows how uh, the Ottoman Empire's financial innovations continue and evolve in today's world. And more case studies we provide, it is more evidence we give to show that this evolutionary theory of financial innovation is valid from the perspective of Islamic finance as well. So briefly, uh, this study provides evidence for evolution of theory of financial innovation from history of Islamic finance in Muslim world, particularly from Ottoman Empire and modern Malaysia and South Indonesia. The Islamic financial products in Malaysia Empire still influence the financial products, inclu including prominent players of Islamic finance industry in Malaysia and Indonesia. And this study has a limitation that it's overlooking how financial products in European history affected Islamic financial innovation in Ottoman Empire. Because even today's world, the conventional finance affects the Islamic finance. And it's also possible that these Ottoman products has been influenced by uh, European financial products, especially the direct claims that the Islam has been influenced by the Spanish Juro. Uh, to finance war against Andalus, the Spanish come up with juros 
uh, Azure is the name of the financial product, a perpetual bond to finance war. So some claim this SM is, is a similar and uh, influence from this Jura uh, from the Spain. So this study is overlooking that. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yarsh, for uh, the succinct presentation and walking us through the key historical milestones that have shaped the development of Islamic financial product institutions. Um, can you open it to Q and A session? So, yeah, Prof. Yeah, yeah, please. Please, 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 Uh, okay, my uh, paper is not, uh, I mean, it's a little bit connected to history, but not uh, directly connected to history. So uh, I'm not providing something new about history. So in that sense, I don't need an archive because it's, there are so many documents about, uh, so many studies about Keshe Vakuf and Esam already. So I'm not coming with something new from history. So I, I mean, these things are already well documented in so many studies. But uh, uh, it's in today's today's world. I mean, uh, there were some products in Ottoman, uh, unique products, and there are uh, evolution of those products in modern financial markets, like a cash work of uh, it's orig orig originating Ottoman Empire. So cash work of Sukuk is of course influenced by uh, Ottoman Empire. So we can say that. Uh, so, I mean, uh, there are uh, there were some uh, important uh, <clears throat> Ottoman innovations in this uh, finance sector. One is Malikane, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cash work as it is, uh, you know, uh, implemented. It is probably uh, in the Islamic world. It is the first example, I guess, Ottoman cash backs. Yes, uh, yeah. there are so many discussions in Ottoman Empire. I mean, I mean uh, the dis discussions we know, before we know. it emerged. Yeah, we, we, we do understand it, yeah. but uh, the first implementation of cash backs 
uh, Arnold Otto olarak yes. I write. So these are within within the history of the, within Islamic finance history. These are uh, really important uh, turning points, uh, if you see. So uh, how it has impact on uh, the modern development of uh, you know Islamic financial institutions is 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 another uh, uh, issue, and I think uh, this Murat Zakcha uh, is uh, doing quite a lot on this uh, uh, in, in in this session. But my point, my question yeah. is. Where does Islamic begin and end in this entire uh, finance uh, history uh, narrative? I mean, uh, this cash walk. The name is cash walk, but it is very, very, uh, you know, çok zayıf bir görüş üzerine inşa edilmiş bir pratik nihayetinde within the Islamic. Uh, uh, legal uh, approach. It is a very uh, un. Uh, how, how do you say it? Zayf? Weak. Weak. Yes. Uh, you know. Uh, then the question is, where does Islamic begin and end? I mean, if a Muslim do anything, is it automatically Islamic, <laughs> or uh, is it like that? Uh, if it is done by the Ottomans, or uh, I, I didn't get the exact question or, I mean, well, what is the question exactly? Uh, I mean, I mean Keshwak is weak, yes. Uh, yes, but uh, I mean, uh, my point is in this entire story, when we talk about uh, uh, Islamic finance, uh, where do you put the uh, borders? Uh -huh. What do you count as Islamic? And uh, what do you count? as un-Islamic in this okay. financial practices. Okay. This uh, is because, as I said, I mean, uh, cash walk of issue is very, very controversial, very, very weak position. Even uh, if you even count that one within the scope of it, uh, uh, I think uh, the public has the right to yeah. suspect it. Today. Yeah, uh, actually, there is discussion in the literature about, I mean, elasticity of uh, the the Sharia regarding the innovations in Islamic finance. Like there is all there is uh, regarding this literature of Islamic financial innovation. There are two kinds of discussion. One one aspect is focusing on the Sharia ruling, like how much it is flexible for innovation. Another aspect is the modern, I mean, modern side of like a scientific part of it, like the, the mathematic part or financial engineering part or uh, the conventional side of it, in other words. So regarding sh sh Sharia aspect, of course, uh, many uh, Islamic financial products uh, can still have some debates whether they are really Islamic or not, uh, not, not just for this cash vacuum. Uh, there are so many products uh, that have more fierce debate than cash vacuum. That are more controversial than cash vacuum, uh, but still practiced by many Muslim countries. So it is really depending on the regulatory bodies and the central Sharia boards uh, that countries have. We, uh, it is all about their ruling. Sometimes uh, countries becoming more strict about Sharia ruling. Sometimes they are more flexible. Uh, so it is really depending on those people in the boards and the countries. Uh, regarding this case, uh, it seems uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the authorities are fine with those practices. So that is why they are allowing and using these uh, products. And also, I know uh, maybe I should also highlight that in the conclusion. Uh, I should I should maybe say that like it's all it's these evolutions are just coming from Ottoman, but it's actually uh, also coming from conventional finance. It can be coming from other countries as well from similar practices. So there there are so many determinants for these financial innovation, but Ottoman is just partially explain uh, those products. So of course. They are mixing uh, cash work of it microfinance. So microfinance is coming from another country, of course, or they mix with uh, banking. Banking is coming from another uh, civilization country. So 
so of course it's a mix of uh, many different practices and products uh, we can say that yeah. i mean one point of the, yeah. both this uh, malikana example yeah. as well as uh, cash work uh, was for uh, public good yeah i mean uh, malikana was for the state finance uh -huh. uh, through this entire system it it was it didn't have anything to do with private earning yeah, yeah. Uh, you know also cash work of because there are loan sharks they charge 30 percent so cash work of charge 10 percent so government say okay let's do this for uh, example uh, and it, it was it, it, i mean the expectation is that it is spent on uh you know well uh, keeping the most uh, you know for public services but uh, today the issue is uh, more about uh, private earnings uh i think that should be that should also have a bearing uh on uh how you approach it so do you understand I mean, private earnings but yeah i mean uh, it should be profit oriented yes. yeah 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 that's true like optimum is kind of socialist uh having social practices and uh, free market is not very available and maybe this is one of the reasons for the economic fall down of the Ottoman yes. Empire. Excuse me, could you oh. continue the discussion after? Because we need oh, to get done? one more question here. Okay. We are almost I'm sorry. Can, can, we, can we get Professor Okay, uh, so I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, I have a few questions, but I think there's no time. Sure. Um, so on this issue of, uh, what do you call it, um, profit, right? Mm -hmm. So you, I, I'd like you to explain a little bit more about what you mean by Ottoman system being proto, pseudo, Ottoman, socialism uh -huh. um i mean the system was definitely profit oriented the whole idea of tax farming was to provide uh what do you call it uh, income um for um for bureaucrats um and for the state right um and and these were actually i think ikta ikta for example goes back to to mongol uh, practices and were adopted by uh, by arabs and and Ottomans later on, um, but I think it's an interesting point you make about pseudo proto. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is uh, also, uh, I mean, written by Murat Chazakcha. He is also uh, writing this. Uh, I mean, there are reasons why uh, Ottoman Empire like didn't uh, allow too much free market practices. Like, uh, like some kind of discussion in the literature is that they don't want uh, like a kind of uh, rich. Uh, like uh, capitalist rivals to the empire, like if they are financially rich, uh, they can be kind of a threat to the empire if they are too powerful. Sorry, Murat, when, yeah. when you say that, mm -hmm. um, you, you, you need to specify which period, because mm -hmm. if, if you're talking about the 15th century or the 16th century, yeah, yeah. No, nobody was, no one was, even in Europe, they were not encouraging free market mm -hmm. enterprise. If you're talking about the 19th century, that's another, another mm -hmm. matter. So you need to specify that, uh -huh. in which period you're talking about. I mean, it would not be uh -huh. unreasonable for the Ottomans to restrict free market in the 16th century, because everyone was restricting free market. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, I cannot, I'm, I'm not expert in history, so maybe the historians can talk about which century, but from my understanding in general ottoman was like that like um, not for a certain century but in general uh they were like that like that that is uh well i mean professor alatas you know says uh, things that provokes uh, uh some questions in my mind that uh, i never uh, asked about uh, because I was uh, looking from a very different paradigm. Uh, yeah, this is the second uh, of today. Uh, this profit uh, motivation, I mean, you say that this uh, uh, tax farming was to provide, uh, you know, the, the private uh, profit. And the the way it worked in the Ottoman Empire was it uh, was like the state uh, relied on the profit uh, motivation of individuals 
to uh, get as much as possible from the financials out from from the taxes that is of course the the uh, it was the uh, search for uh, profit that made the system work but uh, in the literature on tax farming uh, the fact that the uh, you know it was a uh, a way of favoring uh, individuals and classes that was to be favored by the ruling elite uh, is not that much present in this uh, uh, Ottoman uh, story. Uh, as I said, through this uh, making use of this profit uh, uh, motivation, they get as much as possible uh, from the tax base. That was the entire uh, idea, both in iltizam, uh, conventional iltizam, as well as in uh, Malikana. Uh, the, this is uh, pretty much the uh, story. I mean, there is also another discussion, for example, that like uh, some historians claim, I'm, this is not my expertise, but uh, they claim there are so many foundations of in Ottoman Empire because it is a, one of the way of keeping wealth for rich people. Uh, otherwise that government maybe took over their wealth. So when they donate that money to a wakif, it can be even a family wakif. Uh, they can still they preserve their wealth. So that might be another reason why there are so many wakif in Ottoman. So there are also these kind of discussions in literature. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Yash. Uh, I am told to end the session. Uh, can you please give it up for Dr. Yash? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, we've reached the end of day one of the two-day international conference on the Ottomans and the Malay world. So before I can let you go and we we close the session. I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Abdurraz. Alami. Alami is not here. Yeah. Then uh, Prof. Farib, inshallah. <laughs> uh, you will give the last sets of uh, our tokens of appreciation to our moderator and our speaker, inshallah. You're welcome, sister. Yeah, the moderator. Uh, the speaker, sir. Yes, our moderator. Oh, uh, members, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the only thing remaining uh, is praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward all our efforts since morning up to now with a lot of ajr in this dunya and yawmul akhira. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward our efforts to translate uh, into betterment of this ummah in future, insha'Allah. Wal-asr inna al-insana dafi khusr إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبارك الله فيكم oh, we, we have the last item there is a we, the, the tea break <laughs> is waiting upstairs inshallah I'm not going to